Welcome to Films from the Phantom Zone, your podcast about failed and forgotten comic book movies, where we watch a forgotten superhero movie and decide, does this belong in the Phantom Zone, or out and about for everyone to rewatch and remember fondly. My name is Arnaldo. I am your host. I'm joined by my good friend, Birdo. Birdo, what movie are we doing today? X-Men 3, The Last Stand, or is it just X-Men, The Last Stand? It's just called X-Men, The Last Stand. X-Men, The Last Stand. 2006 sequel end of the trilogy to sequel to x2 x-men united aka x-men 2 um (laughs) and x-men yeah so we just did those other two movies if you're listening to this you haven't heard us talk about x-men or x2 those episodes are out they were a good time my wife sable was on one of them that first episode i listened back to that whole thing i really enjoyed it we had a good time we're great people yeah (laughs) (laughs) we are just so funny (laughs) <laughs> this movie is available on Disney Plus in the legacy section because it's not an MCU movie yet, I guess. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, who knows what's going to happen <laughs> at, at this rate? The Venom movies can be called MCU now. So uh, <laughs> where are we on that? <laughs> uh, so there we go. Anyway, um, so this is films from the Phantom Zone. We're going to do our initial expectations for this movie, X-Men The Last Stand. We're going to do... A little bit of background. I got a little bit of background. Just barely, though. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we're going to do our initial expectations. Did I say that? Then yes. we're going to get into the plot of the movie. It makes up the bulk of the episode. And then we're going to analyze the movie to the best of our abilities before we get into Keep or Cancel, the fun segment where we decide, are some of these people in this movie going to get kept or canceled? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty much it. <laughs> That's it. And then finally, we're going to put this movie either into the Phantom Zone to be forgotten or we'll decide if this is worth a rewatch. Five bucks if you can guess our answer before the episode's over. <laughs> I, hey, you may not know. You may not know what I think about this movie. Let's get into it. Are you oh, ready? boy. Yeah. So there's time codes in the description. So if you want to you know, scroll right down on your phone app and then decide, I'm going to jump around because I don't want to hear them talk about this particular thing, you can do that if you want to be a dick. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you can do that. Okay. Let's get into it. Initial expectations, Birdo. What what were your expectations watching X Men Three, X Men um, United, X Men Fuck? Whoa, last whoa, end. whoa! God, it's, it's hard to keep it all together. I think the first time I was really excited because coming off the heels of X Two, X Men United, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know that ended on quite the cliffhanger. You know, we were like, oh, we're gonna maybe find out more about Wolverine. We don't yeah. really find out anything about him in this movie. Um, I think by this point they were already green lighting the. The X-Men Origins? Yeah. I think so. So I think that kind of covered that basis. Um, and then, you know, oh, what's going to happen with uh, Jean and the Phoenix? Because, yeah. you know, she got drowned and then there was a giant silhouette of a Phoenix underneath the water. Yep. The hell's up with that? So <laughs> going in, I was I was younger when this came out. So I was kind of excited. I was expecting another smash hit, I guess. Yeah. Kind of missed the mark a little bit. I was in high school. So, like, this was kind of the epic conclusion to the trilogy. And at this point, we had two ongoing Marvel series, which was this and Spider-Man, when I'm this age. And they were both kind of ending at the same time. Spider-Man before or after this? After. So, Spider-Man was 02, 04, and 07, I think. And this is 2000, 2003, and 2006. Okay. Something like that. And so, these things that I loved when I was, like early middle school late elementary school they're coming to a close like, yeah they're coming to close like this is it, it was right in that age gap for me like a very pivotal six years yeah you know from elementary school to high school so i'm like oof, yeah like I, obviously like expectations were through the roof for this movie yeah like, this was at the time the most expensive movie ever made that's insane it was, it was very quickly <laughs> surpassed by something else <laughs> i think it was pirates of the caribbean like quickly passed it oh yeah i yeah. can definitely see that, that those those were known movie those were known for being very expensive yeah expectations were through the roof and i don't i think i thought it was just fine were you like eh, it's like a step down i don't remember what i thought but they, this movie is very much kind of like it's dragged through the mud a lot like people don't like this no and so sometimes like if it's been a long time since I watch a movie, I'll forget what my own opinions are, and I'll remember what like the world's opinions are, like the internet's opinions are, the Unimind's opinions. Yeah, <laughs> seriously though, <laughs> you know, and I have to kind of like go back and be like, well, wait a second, like I have a different opinion. It, that happened when we when we watched Batman because like 
if the Unimind, I'm glad you brought this up. The Unimind's <laughs> opinion. I'm glad we're using Unimind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about Brainstorm? No, Unimind. The Unimind's opinion is that the Burton movies are way better than the Schumacher movies. We rewatched those and I'm like, these two movies are kind of weird. I really like the second Burton movie though. I thought you didn't like that no, one. I like Batman Returns. That was the one I liked. That's the one I didn't like very much. That's the one I was like, I'm all about this weird shit. Oh, it's too weird. I'm like, <laughs> people don't remember. I think people like don't remember how weird it is and how little Batman's in it. <laughs> it's a villain movie. <laughs> yeah. It's a villain like expose is what it is. It's, it's so dumb. And then that first Schumacher's movie is pretty good, I think. The villains are horrible. Everything else is fine. So it's kind of like... You go back and I'm like, oh, my opinion's different than all these people. So <laughs> it, it, that's kind of one of the reasons why, you know, we do this. We rewatch some of these old ones. We revisit and form our own opinions on it. Yeah. Them. Anyway, so you'll see what my opinions are this time around. Oh. But I was expected to like, I was like, oh, maybe I'll think something different. So. Well, I'm sure worse X-Men movies have come out since this one. <laughs> Apocalypse. Oh, no, no, definitely. <laughs> I've got a little bit of background here, but like, here's the thing. Some of this movie is based on the phoenix saga right like loosely yeah and the thing about the phoenix saga is that it was it's a very long thing that happened yeah it during had, the a, X-Men it had a long build-up no exactly that's what yeah. i'm saying it was like chunks of it happened throughout years you know be, between the time when like the phoenix discovered her there were retcons involved like it's called a saga for a reason like it's very long yeah you know so it's just kind of like there's no like one issue you can read, so I'm like, okay, cool. Like, you gotta go let me get like, a little bit of background. Various and... like eras of X Men comics in order to get the story. Yeah, with a little bit of Fantastic Four sprinkled in there too. So yeah. <laughs> so, so honestly, like, there's some probably like recaps you can watch or you can kind of read some things. I'm sure, if you go on like the there's... Marvel Unlimited app, you'll find like a Phoenix Saga thing, and it'll yeah, just show sure, you all probably. the issues. But... I remember I had a book a while back. I don't anymore. It was kind of like. An encyclopedia on on like Marvel characters. Mm-hmm. There was one on just X Men because it's wow. it's so dense, big. Yeah, it's so dense, and you could go in there and flip around and it had all kinds of stuff in it. But like, honestly, like I don't even know if it's worth like, mentioning. I don't know if it is there anything like about the Phoenix Saga that you want to talk about. Mm, just that like this movie doesn't really do the Phoenix Saga justice. I think okay, but like why? Uh, well, we have none of the cosmic parts of it at all i guess that's yeah that's that's the main one <laughs> that's kind of a big part uh, and yeah. also like we just we don't have the same build up and i don't feel the same attachment to gene i felt some attachment towards gene because you know she had her two movies and the most saga quote unquote that they did is yeah they planted these seeds in the last movie to yeah. be resolved in this film <laughs> but that's not a saga no, that's you know I mean? uh, that's a <laughs> character plot. Yeah, I hope the next time they do this because they. I mean, you think they, they're going to do it a third time? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think by the time it's the MCU's turn, though, I think it's one of those things they that might they're going to be like do the Phoenix thing, though. Well, I think it's one of those things where they're going to say, "Let's plant the seeds slowly, and we'll worry about it in ten years." You know okay. what I mean? So it's kind of like after a decade of seeing the X Men in the MCU, now they do the Phoenix saga. I think that'd be cool. Yeah, basically. Jean Grey was part of the original roster of the X-Men, right? Um, Marvel Girl. Marvel Girl. But at that point, she wasn't very powerful. Like, she was kind of the damsel in distress character. And then by the time... She was like Daphne from (laughs) Scooby-Doo. By the time the guy from Chris Claremont. Yeah, by the time he takes over, they start kind of planting these seeds. She starts going by Phoenix because, like, she has, like, this... I don't want to misquote. Here's the, that's the other thing. It's like again, there's there's a lot of stuff here. I don't want to say anything yeah. wrong. But like this cosmic they, entity, like yeah, enters well, her. <laughs> she has she has a traumatic experience, and she has some psychic abilities, but she wasn't like super super strong. But then because of this like trauma that she experienced, it was like a friend's death or something like that. Mm-hmm. Like she had like this kind of explosion of like psychic ability, which the professor noticed. He felt it from wherever he was, and also the Phoenix Force felt it. Right. And so the Phoenix found her to be like a suitable host, basically. Yeah. But then basically years go by before it became comes a big deal. And it's not really unleashed until they go out into space. It's like a Fantastic Four crossover, crossover thing. Yeah. yeah. They go to space and then it finally becomes unleashed and then it's a problem and they got to fucking deal with it, right? Yeah. So I'm not doing that any justice. But again, it's not really something that's like super recapable. You know? There's just, there's a lot. 
Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot, <laughs> and it's through, like, various runs of comics. And yeah. So do, hard I mean, to keep up with. <laughs> yeah. Like, do yourself a favor. I found a couple YouTube uh, videos that are, like, half hour long, but it's, like, part one and part two and part three. It's, so it's, like, yeah, okay. <laughs> is it them talking about it, or is it them, like, literally, like, reading the comics? Because there's some YouTube channels that'll, like... No, they, they talk the about comic. it. They, they talk about it, but like it's again, there's a lot of context yeah. in each comic when you talk about them like True. today, right? Yeah, because there'll be a lot of things like, oh, this happens, and it's like this connects to Fantastic Four issue 256. Like, no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get into the plot. <laughs> 20 years ago, a DH Professor X and Magneto arrived to Jean's house to enroll her in their school. The parents mention Jean's illness, to which Magneto reacts aggressively. Young Jean reads their minds and displays her powers by levitating all the cars in the street, along with the water coming out of Stan Lee's garden hose. Ten years ago, a young boy in a bathroom is caught by his father, cutting off his wings. So this is a pretty good intro to the movie, actually. Uh, yeah, and well, I'm going to let you go on, but there's a lot of good stuff in this. No, surprisingly, I agree that there's good stuff. Is it always executed well? We'll see. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but this is one of those good things, though. Getting like one of those flashback scenes to give us a little bit more context on Jean. Yeah. They at least tried to like focus the movie on her character, you know? Mm-hmm. We get our Stanley cameo at the beginning of the movie. This is his first one. He wasn't in the last two movies. Oh my god, he wasn't. Yeah. Holy shit. Like a Stanley cameo at the time wasn't like a guaranteed thing. No. Like he was in Fanta- he was in the two Fantastic Four movies. Yes. But those came out after this anyway. Yeah. He well, was he was in before, all the Spider Man one ones. One before right? one after. He's in Spider Man one, two, and three, yeah. Okay. But yeah, wow, I guess he wasn't in X Men and X Men two. Huh. But yeah, we got our Stanley cameo. And then when it cuts to uh like the ten years ago with uh Angel, mm-hmm. that scene is kind of powerful. It's scary, right? Yeah. Like, I get really, uh, the knives and the blood freak me out. Yep. Like, they yep. really freak yep. me yep. out. I'm like, I, it just felt like I was hacking my own limbs away. <sighs> yeah. He had, like, it's every like sharp object he looking. could find. I remember when I was yeah. watching it, first off, I was like, that's the kid from Sharkboy and Lava Girl. Is it really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, wow. like, the main kid. <laughs> my second takeaway from that scene was, wow, I used some of those tools in woodshop glass. <laughs> Oh, yeah? And he was using it on his body. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> like, when I saw him using that, because I know what that tool can do, I'm like, ugh. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> on his body. Yeah. Gross. The de-aging looks not bad. This was one of the... For I remember the time, this. yeah. Not, looking at it right now, it's like, well, that looks fake. But, you know, in, like, know. in thought, like 2006. It Six. It's one of the first times they had used de-aging was in this movie. How did they do it? Because I know they didn't do, like, deep fake stuff because that wasn't a thing yet. No, they still don't do that. Oh, yeah, they still don't do that. Yeah. Uh, it, it's possible, but they're not using it. They um, should. No, they basically just kind of, like, pull their features back. They pull their skin back. Kind of, like, like, digitally. Digitally, yeah. Uh, a lot of times people look, like, airbrushed, though. Yeah, it's a tough part. And Professor the, X kind of looks a yeah, little bit airbrushed. It's the un- uncanny valley, but yeah. I, thought, I thought they looked good enough. I really like the flashback because it's you get more of... You know, that they're doing the school together. That it's yeah. Charles and Eric. No, Magneto. this is a little in conflict with the later movies, but... <laughs> oh, totally. That's kind of my other big problem. But it really... Okay, here's the thing. is It's not this movie's fault. If you set the precedent, no. then you have to adhere to it in the future. Right. The future movies kind it, of fuck things up a bit. Ignore this movie. And there's there's other uh, instances later on, yeah. too, with a couple other characters. They ignore this movie completely. As good as some of those newer movies are. But, but it would be nice yeah. to have some continuity. You know, the continuity, I think, starts getting really fucked up with the Wolverine movies. It's all over Actually, the place. X-Men Origins Wolverine. That's when the continuity just goes out the window. Yeah. It's all <laughs> over the place. Yeah. So anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing Jean's uh, powers kind of like start to come out a little bit. Even when she was a kid, they were already kind of like out of control. Yeah. Which is a little weird because in like X-Men 1, she's like not that powerful. Well, they explain it that... Oh, Professor like, X has been holding he her back. He suppressed her. Yeah. yeah. So at first, she's already super powerful. So has she already it, been touched by the Phoenix Force at this point? Yeah. And he explains yeah. it. And we're going to get to it. But like, I do like that Gene presents, and they didn't really explore it that much, but Gene no. does present this debate for their two schools of thought, Professor X and Magneto, where Professor X wants to live harmoniously with humans. And that means holding back your own power, yeah. checking yourself in order to 
make the other people more comfortable. Yeah. Whereas Magneto's the opposite. Yeah, he's like, why should we have to do yeah, that? Yeah, we should be ourselves and they should deal with us. And you see that right from this scene. Now, again, they didn't do that much with it, but it the no. thought is there, right? There was definitely more of that done in the previous movies than in this yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it could have been better. The not-so-distant future. X-Men are fighting in a fiery dystopia. Colossus, Kitty Pride, Iceman, and Rogue are led by Storm and a very nonchalant Wolverine who is trying to light his cigar off a flaming car. They're being attacked by a sentinel. Wolverine goes against Storm's instructions and has Colossus throw him at the head of the sentinel, which he cuts off and falls back down in front of the team. Their surroundings disappear into the danger room where they were training the new X-Men. So this part's a little silly. I have so many fucking questions about this scene. <laughs> Let's just take it from the top. Number right. one, how did he light his cigar off the fire that's not real? Yeah, isn't that like holograms? Yeah, it's all holograms. But they are in like, like they can like feel things still though. The like danger the, room's weird. The danger room is supposed to have like, yeah, like guns and shit that fire at them. And then there's holograms and then it all kind of comes together. It's like Mysterio from Far From I Home. I was just literally going to say, it's like the drones in Mysterio from <laughs> yeah. Far From Home. And if they make a new danger room with a new X-Men, it should just have that. Like, use Stark technology. Like, they just steal it, and they're like, we're going to use this for training, yeah. So, he can't do that, and he knows that he can't do that, so he's being stupid by even trying. Uh, number two, that room isn't that very, isn't that big. We saw it when the holograms turned off. In the cartoons, it's huge, which makes more sense. Right. But in this, it's not that big, so were they yeah, running... It's a- like a room. Yeah, so, like, how were they running <laughs> around? Where did Colossus throw Wolverine, really? Like, wasn't that much space. Why are there sentinels? Like, how do they know to prepare for Sentinels if we've never, if they don't exist yet? Or do they exist? Have they existed already in this universe? That's not this movie's fault, though. <laughs> but no, but why introduce the Sentinels in a hologram because as a training it's exercise? A X Men staple. That's but, literally the only but reason. But do they know that, though? Probably not. They're like, all right, there's no giant robots that attack us in this. Ratner was just like, hey, we're going to put a Sentinel in here because that's X Men. I guarantee you that's how yeah, the probably. pitch went. But like, why? <laughs> um, it just doesn't make it doesn't make sense. Te- so, so, technically, Sentinels were made in the '60s. Okay, but first of all, we don't know that yet. And second of all, <laughs> are we supposed to think that they fought Sentinels in the '60s? Is that the implication here? I guess not. It just it doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> uh, and and lastly, that Sentinel head comes down. And does a full 360 degrees. And yet somehow Wolverine shows up behind it. Was he riding the Sentinel head? Because if he was, that means he would have had to have crawled like Spider-Man. I think they just did a generic action scene for this. But do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> no, the yeah, there's falls, a lot of... <laughs> the head does a full 360 degrees. So where was he? <laughs> Unless if he... Okay, here's the only thing. Maybe he turns he, invisible. He falls down. He just falls straight down because he fucking hit a wall. There's nothing there. <laughs> he falls straight down and just walked forward you know honestly i think when they wrote this scene they were like hey don't think about it too much Ugh, i can't help but Th- think about this it is one much. of those scenes where they're like hey don't think about it it's just action it's fun but why is he lighting the f- that's not even one that's like because i'm thinking too much gag. about it <laughs> all right well, think about who wrote this movie <laughs> um actually the two writers are quite experienced it's uh cal pen and um not cal pen um, oh uh then why did it end uh, up this way? And uh, Kinberg. Roberto Orkey. No, no, not, not those guys. <laughs> okay. Rogue is upset with Bobby after seeing him share a moment in the danger room with Kitty. Wolverine finds Cyclops, who is still depressed over the death of Jean, and tells him to move on. Cyclops hits him with, not everyone heals as fast as you, Logan. That's a good line. It is. That's why I wrote it down. <laughs> That's a good one. I'm not sure how much time has passed. Is I, it just a few months? I wanted to say like two years. Oh, like real time? Well, yeah. And the only reason I think that is because Jean's hair grows very long. And the last movie was short. Oh. She had shoulder length hair in the last movie. And now it's like And now it's like down to her back. Yeah, but that could just be the phoenix. (laughs) Yeah, but like, (laughs) that's an amount of hair that takes like years to grow. So that's why I thought it was in real time. All the same kids are still in school. So like, I don't know. I feel like they're in school like forever. Yeah, pretty much. So like I don't I don't know maybe like a maybe at least a year right that's a fair assessment yeah I wish they would actually like tell you instead of just being like oh some time passed well this thing is like it's the not so distant future right that could mean anything that could mean anything but the not so distant future from like the current day right which means like because I was thinking a little too hard about this <laughs> the twenty years ago 
you can date that because if the movie is set in the not so distant future, that means it's all relative to the present, meaning right. 2006. So 20 years ago, that's 1986 when they went to see Gene. Okay. In 1996 is when Angel, Angel was, was cutting his trying wings to hide a, hide yeah. himself. And the only reason I bring that up is because when we get to the fucking prequels, we're gonna see how none of this makes any sense. None of it. All lines the ages up are different. All. Yeah. Because I mean, these guys are supposed to be what, like in their fifties? when they visited Gene? I guess they would be in like their 50s. Maybe early 40s? 50s? Now they're in their early 70s, but even that's too old. Well, Because Magneto was alive in World War II. Oh, yeah, you can actually date him then. Then by the 86, he should be at least like 50. Yeah, yeah. he would have been like a teen. Not a teen, but he, he, he was, was like, like 10. Like 10 or 12 or and something. And that was in the 40s, like early 40s. Yeah. Yeah. So Professor X is teaching mutant ethics and speaks of the ethics of using their powers over their human fellows. He shows a video of Moira McTaggart. Of course he does. (laughs) Who researches a man who is alive but has no consciousness. He and Storm are joined by Hank McCoy, a.k.a. Beast, a retired X-Men who is large and blue and now Secretary of Mutant Affairs. He tells them of Worthington Labs, a pharmaceutical company that has created a cure for mutants using a mutant named Jimmy. (laughs) A debate in the office ensues about whether or not a cure is necessary, especially for mutants who can't blend in like Hank or those who can't live a normal life like Rogue. So the same Hank who was on TV in the last movie, not Blue. Right. Yeah. There's, <laughs> and we said that, there's a ton of continuity errors and in And now he's films. being played by Frasier. Correct. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed this, in an upcoming scene, we meet Bolivar Trask. Who's played by a black man. Who is clearly not Peter Dinklage. <laughs> right. For a bunch of different reasons. No two men look more different than these guys. <laughs> right. Well, it's almost like the whole like Two-Face thing with uh, Harvey Dent. Yeah. Like, come on. You go from Lando Calrissian to yeah. Agent K? No, but this is like a <laughs> six-foot black man and like a three-foot white man. <laughs> huge, um, huge, huge difference. Yeah, big difference. But... At least in that, like, that was an Easter egg. Like, he was on TV for a split second. We only caught him because we were looking for him. All right. Do you think he created the Sentinels in this timeline? Oh, uh, yeah. Maybe he's like, all right, he already created the Sentinels. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm wiping out all the mutants as we speak. Yeah. I think there's something interesting here, and it's about Professor X's ethics. Mm-hmm. And I think this is a very interesting thing that the movie starts to do and then just doesn't finish doing. He is literally talking about the ethics of using your power over other people, whether they be mutants or humans. And he compares, he's like, the reason you can't do it is because you'd be a tyrant if you did, basically. And you know what? I agree with that 100%. But isn't that what he does this whole movie? He's a little bit of a hypocrite. Right. But I think he justifies it by being like, well, if I don't do this, then bad shit's going to happen, you know? But that's like also- He feels like he's doing it for the right reasons, but... But that's also what tyrants are. Yeah. Like tyrants, they, they have control over other people who do not consent. They don't have the consent of their governed, right? Right. Because they think they know best. And they think, right. Why? And they don't think they're wrong. They're not necessarily malicious. Mm-hmm. They think they're doing it for the right reasons. Is that not what Is Professor, Professor X, X a tyrant? Here? Well, I think that's the comparison the movie starts to make and then doesn't really... Like, it, doesn't, it doesn't it run fizz, with it. It fizzles out real quick. Yeah. But... I think it's a super interesting debate here. It's another one of those good things that doesn't quite get yeah. touched on. No, I think I think that's kind of the main theme of this movie is the ethics of like mutants and, and humans. Mm-hmm. And coming from the most one of the most powerful, not only one of the most powerful X Men or mutants, but like the most powerful one in the most invasive way, because his superpower, <sighs> you know, he reads minds and he can control people. And how, I, do, how do you know if he is controlling you? Yeah, or not? I guess you don't. And I would liken him to like, because it's you know when we talk about like mind control, or whatever, it's fake and it's hard to kind of like grasp and debate. But like, compare him to like if your superpower was like you had X-ray vision and you could see people naked, and right. no one's stopping you, and maybe no one knows that you can do it. But it, is it is it right? No, you're violating it, all right. those people. And it would be very easy to say like, no, that's not okay, because. That's someone's like private parts. I'm like, you don't have the right to just see someone naked if you want to. Absolutely not, right? Right. So like how but how is that different than like entering someone's minds and their private thoughts? That might be worse, actually. Well, well that's my point. <laughs> yeah. But it's like I feel like if you talk about like Professor X's powers, they just don't seem as bad as if 
you had x-ray vision and could see someone naked then i feel like in that way like it's very clear cut you know what i mean yeah this is a topic that really does need to have like a deep dive into it yeah and and it never happens it doesn't yeah it movie it sets up a like a very interesting thing and, and I'm like, no Ooh. other movie in the franchise touches on it yeah <laughs> maybe they're scared to god i don't know jimmy little kid uh his he's leech in the comic books he's usually green and kind of froggy <laughs> he lives in like the sewers he's gross yeah he can, like barely speak english um because <laughs> he like was just kind of like raised underground or whatever then yeah he can kind of like stop mutant powers from like 50 feet radius so like if you're close to him you got nothing doesn't matter who you are right but i could definitely see how his uh his power is useful for what they're trying to do yeah <laughs> angel also original x-men we talked about this yes he has like two lines in this movie <laughs> Yeah, and he does like a cool. He's got one cool scene. He got one cool scene, <laughs> and then he doesn't do anything. Well, I think what's interesting is that they put him as the center of like the Worthington Labs is the company that creates a cure, right? Because of Angel, but yeah. like there's so much potential there for all kinds of stuff, and they don't do yeah. any of it. <laughs> no, and uh, it sucks because that could have been a cool little side plot going on in the movie. Yeah. Oh, no, it's a B-plot that's two scenes long. It's a total of, like, five minutes. <sighs> you're planting seeds, and you're not reaping them. Yeah. <laughs> At yet another abandoned church. I don't know where there's this many abandoned churches, but we've seen, like, uh, three. In the X-Men universe, they're everywhere. <laughs> they're everywhere. <laughs> no one's Catholic anymore. <laughs> At yet another abandoned church, a mutant group meets to discuss the cure. Magneto arrives to deliver a speech that this is just another step in their war against mutants. What is a voluntary cure now will be a mandatory weapon later. He and Pyro attract the attention of a mutant gang with edgy as fuck tattoos named the Omegas. One of the Omegas, Callisto, can detect mutants. Magneto uses her powers to locate Mystique, who is being kept in a mobile prison. So they're supposed to be like, does Magneto have a group called the Omegas? Or is this like Omega level mutants or okay, so Omega Red? The Omegas. <laughs> or do they just want an edgy name? <laughs> they're a mutant outcast mob. Okay, so they're heavily inspired by the Morlocks from the comics. So I don't think the Omegas are a thing in the comics, but the okay. Morlocks are. Callisto is also an amalgamation of two characters. They do that a lot in these movies. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, because when I look up like Omega and Mutants, it just shows me the Omega level mutants. Yeah. yeah. Which I, I guess is not a thing in the movies. It would have been interesting if it was. Although They're just like classes, like there's class only one like, through five or whatever. There's only like three of them that appear in the movies, though. And I'll be like Gene, Iceman, and Magneto. The character combined the powers of the comics Callisto with another of the Morlocks, Caliban. And is written to be someone who could be beautiful, but with a tough persona. Isn't Caliban uh, in the movie? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, like, Caliban's in, like, a couple of the movies, I think. Yeah. So there are multiple characters that can sense other X-Men, or mutants. Okay. Um, Apparently, the girl, uh, Dania Ramirez, the actress, mm -hmm. auditioned to play a mutant prostitute, Stacey X. Uh, oh. But they were impressed by her, so they cast her as Callisto. Then Stacey X is not in this movie. But that would have been interesting, I think. What a fucking horrible idea is to keep Mystique in a mobile prison. Like, she's just, like, in a trailer. It's stupid. Holy shit. <laughs> Especially you know who's going to come after her eventually. And you have no safeguards against that. Like, you should keep her in the plastic prison. So yeah, that Magneto that can never get there. That way can't break in. Yeah. Somewhere, like, locked away underground. Fucking keep her in a fucking car. So stupid. Holy <laughs> shit. Okay. <laughs> Scott... I still love how edgy they are. It looks so dumb. <laughs> like, that's one thing that it does age this movie is, like... It like, reminds me of the villains Omegas. from Elektra. Yeah. Not as bad, but close. <laughs> <laughs> or the demons from Ghost Rider. Ghost Rider, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Knew that was coming. <laughs> Scott visits Alkali Lake and hears Jean in his mind. He yells for her to stop, shoots the lake in frustration, and Jean appears. She takes his sunglasses off, saying she can control her power enough to hold back his lasers. They kiss but then she sucks the life out of him. Professor X feels Jean's powers and sends Wolverine and Storm. They arrive to find rocks floating in the air, Scott's sunglasses, and Jean unconscious. Poor Scott. 
<laughs> okay, so I mean, this is how they write off Cyclops. Yeah. Um, the actor James Marston left this movie along with Brian Singer and Brian Singer's writers. So it could do... be Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> he's not Jimmy Olsen. I think he's Jimmy Olsen. No, he's a new character. Are you sure? In Superman Returns? He's not Jimmy Olsen. I thought it? he was. No. I also haven't seen Superman Returns in like over a decade though, so. No, he's Richard White. Who the fuck is Richard An White? An original character, I'm pretty sure. Uh, we'll get to Superman Returns when we get to Superman Returns. Oh, Jimmy Olsen's the guy from Fanboys. Yeah, he's in that movie, yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> I remember him in that movie. I remember him and Perry White leaning over like the newspaper and going like, is Clark Superman? They're like, nah. <laughs> the only thing I remember from that movie is the scene with the plane yeah. and Kevin Spacey on the Kryptonite Island. <laughs> That's all I remember. That's like the beginning and the end of that movie. <laughs> Nothing in between. <laughs> oh, uh, and the piano. Like the kid like pushes oh, yeah, the piano yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's that's it. So it's it just sucks that he couldn't be more involved in this film. And like usually for actors like depending on the on the role but they don't need to be like in, as involved with the movie for as long right they're on set for like a month maybe a few he probably could have done more in this movie he, he clearly did one day uh, of shooting yeah. and then like fucked off to do superman returns i'm like i understand the director and the writers that's a much more time consuming activity right. for them they need like a full two years to make a movie like the actor i'm like i feel like they could have worked around schedules and gotten him like a bigger role in this movie because he gets written off very unceremoniously. <laughs> yeah, for like someone that was a main character in the previous two movies. Yeah. And is kind of a main character in the X-Men franchise, period. Well, I, even in those first two movies, I feel like they don't do Cyclops justice. He no. He doesn't get a whole lot of he's play. He's definitely my favorite character to make fun of in these movies. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean, I like him a lot in the first movie. He's... He has a lot less to do in the second one. And this one, obviously, he's not in it. So, yeah. And he's killed very it's, quickly. Is he killed? Because it's very unclear. <laughs> he's just kind of, like, gone. Well, they don't have enough time with the actor to, like, even, like, film his dead corpse. No. So, like, <laughs> he's <laughs> gone. Just throw his sunglasses <laughs> in the water. <laughs> Good enough. Uh, that sucks. I think this movie would have been a lot better with a lot more Cyclops. Especially since how, like, the film is so gene-centric. I think it would have been a lot better to have some of those emotional scenes between Logan and Gene to be Cyclops and Gene instead. Or a combination, or all yeah. of them, yeah. Or have Cyclops be the one that gets like torn apart at the end yeah. and kill him off that way. That at least has impact. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should write an X-Men movie. <laughs> they should hire us. <laughs> at the mansion, Professor X examines Gene and explains to Wolverine that she seemingly survived the dam collapse by subconsciously encasing herself in a protective cocoon of psychic energy. Yeah, right? That was a sentence. Uh, <laughs> he goes on to explain that Jean is the most powerful mutant he's ever known. Her powers lie in her subconscious mind and is too powerful for her own good. When she was young, he placed psychic barriers in her mind to restrain her powers, which developed a split personality, the subconscious alter ego calling herself the Phoenix. Wolverine questions his ethical involvement in Jean's mind. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Yeah, it's not ethical. And also, like, this is, like, what I was talking about before. It's, like, they completely ignored the fact that the Phoenix is, like, a cosmic entity. And they're, like, oh, yeah. it's just her split personality. It's also, like, of the age, too, where they're, like, we have to make these movies much more grounded yeah. than than the comics. Like, But meanwhile, we had Fantastic Four movies coming out. <laughs> yeah, but those suck. <laughs> they're fun, at least. <laughs> uh, so, I think this might be my favorite scene in the whole movie. I think this might be one of the better written scenes where... When you find out Professor X is the real villain? Kind of. And you know, <laughs> that's the thing is like, Professor X has always been the father figure of these movies right. and of all these characters. And just kind of like poking holes on that and showing that like, yeah, he's not infallible. No, and it makes for interesting uh, storytelling. Yeah, exactly. And carrying on to my complaint early on is that they set up a really interesting thing here with Professor X. And this is the follow-up, but then there's no resolution. This is like you know, a running theme with this this movie, though. Well, well, that's what I'm saying. Is this movie needed to conclude this? You started it. It's here, and then this is this is it. There's no more of this. There's his death later on, but right. in that scene that we're gonna get to, it's very short. There's barely any words exchanged. It just happens. He just disintegrates. Yeah, and so <laughs> it's it's really not enough. Like I feel like you needed a lot more. To kind of wrap up this subplot here. 
because this is this is the meat of the movie i feel like thematically is the ethics of what professor x was doing to gene yeah and it's a damn shame that <laughs> this movie doesn't seem to recognize that <laughs> yeah right but one of the things i when we were talking about the background of the phoenix saga or whatever this is something that they took from the comics like he really did put safeguards in her mind to weaken her you know control her developing powers right and right with good intentions but you know that's... yeah but again does he have the right to do that no <laughs> like it's such an interesting ethical debate that it's just not explored at all yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and in this instance he basically created the split personality because the phoenix force isn't a cosmic entity in this movie no so it's a hundred percent his fault he was literally just like oh wow gene's kind of powerful let's uh let's fuck with that a little yeah. bit yeah but it also kind of confirms well this in the next a couple scenes from here confirms what we were saying about that she had a split personality in the previous movie one is in love with scott, scott the, but other, the is... other one wants to fuck wolverine <laughs> and that's clearly the phoenix that wants to fuck yeah wolverine. again that also would have been more fun had scott been in the movie right you could have explored that a lot more and also, like, since they weren't going to do the whole, like, the real Phoenix thing, they could have at least explored, like, the split personality thing a little bit deeper. And they didn't really do that much either. Like, barely. At the end, like, there's moments where it's like, is it Jean? But, like, then she walks off fucking screen and then we don't see her and then cuts to the next scene. Yeah. So, anyway. Warren Worthington the third, now grown, arrives to his dad's lab to receive the cure. That's Angel. As he's being strapped into the operating table, he changes his mind, unleashes his wings, and jumps out of the building. And that's basically all we see of Angel. I feel like there's something got cut there. There's a ton of missing movie here, clearly. Is it cut content, or was it just I... like they didn't make it? So, if you look at the development of this film, it's one of those things where like they set the date two years in advance. And they're like, no matter what happens, we're hitting this date. <sighs> that never works out no, well. No, of course not. And so, <laughs> Brian Singer leaves the movie... I'm going to go make Superman. And he didn't help write a sequel. Even though he had set all these things in motion, mm. he had a very loose treatment for this movie. And he was like, here, do something with this. That's a J.J. Abrams move. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. And so, you know, they're like, okay, it's Phoenix. Great. That's all we got. And then they have to kind of write around that. And obviously, like, the fact that Cyclops left. Brett Ratner wasn't even the next guy. They had like a list of other... Oh, Brett Ratner um, wasn't even their next pick? Oh, no. Not at all. <laughs> they had a list of other people, oh, including God. like Zack Snyder was on that list. A couple other guys. I forget who. Uh, and then they hired Matthew Vaughn. Matthew Vaughn was the director of this movie for a minute. And he's the one who cast Kelsey think, Grammer. I think that would have been really interesting to see. And he left because he had a personal thing. And also he ended up saying... They weren't going to let me make the movie that I wanted to make. Yeah, no shit. Then he, went and, and then he went and made Kick-Ass. So. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, and so then they landed on Brett Ratner. And by that point, apparently, they were so stressed for time that Ratner said post-production started on day one of filming. Basically, That's bad. <laughs> whatever they finished filming got sent to the editor and they started editing right away. That's so terrible. They're doing steps two and three of a movie at the same time, basically. And that shows in this film. Yeah. We're going to get to it when we talk about the analysis. I don't want to skip ahead. What kind of a miracle this movie got made. <laughs> seriously. Like, seriously. But there is clearly a lot missing story was that they probably didn't film, is what right. I'm getting at. And that's the biggest problem with this film. Here's this whole subplot with Angel. And we, I mean, they breeze through it so quickly that he walks into the room and he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. He's like, all right, we talked about it. And then he's like, wait, I don't want to do this. And he's like, but we talked about it. Nope. And he runs out. You could have been. <laughs> there was almost no conflict. There. I, exactly. <laughs> like this scene should have been much longer. Like it should have been a whole debate, a whole fight. Honestly, I think and this it, movie should have been about 30 minutes longer. Like an hour longer. Maybe. An hour longer. This movie's an hour 40. It's very short. It's short. <laughs> and then he just jumps out the window. Like the jumping out of the window would have been a fun climax to a big argument. Yeah. Like a big scene with a ton of dialogue, yep. a bunch of nuance to it, and that's how it ends. And then It, it was cool to see him like f jump out the window and fly away. Sure, but, but it's meaningless <laughs> when it happens so quickly. Yes. You know? It's just like, oh, he just flew out of the oh, movie. Homeboy's gone. There he goes. Are we going to see him again? Probably not. I guess he didn't get the cure. <laughs> <laughs> Magneto finds the caravan that's holding Mystique prisoner. He easily destroys all the cars and releases Mystique and the other prisoners, Multiple Man and the Juggernaut. 
The guard awakens and shoots Mystique with a cure dart. She turns back into human Rebecca Romaine, and Magneto leaves her now that she's not one of them. News that the cure has been weaponized causes Beast to resign his position to the president. It's kind of fucked up with Magneto because she still believes in his cause. I hmm, <laughs> I see it both ways. Because at first, I remember thinking this movie was like, man, Magneto's fucking cold-hearted. But at the he same is. time, he does feel bad for Mystique. Right, but he's like, he just kind of fucks but he's off. So, well, he's so pragmatic that he's like, there's nothing left for us to do here. And he apologizes. He's like, I'm sorry. But I'm not, I have to leave you now. Bye. And then he's like, it's a shame she was so beautiful. And he's referring to her. The as, real Raven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> right. <laughs> it's a meme now. But like yeah. her, her mutant self. Like not that she's physically beautiful being blue. What he means like she was a beautiful mutant. She God, was a, first class was good. Yeah, it's all right. We'll get there. <laughs> I said the real Raven. <laughs> um, perfection. Perfection. <laughs> So, I, I, like, I get it, you know, like, but he thinks so little of humans that he, now he's like, you're not one of us anymore. No, yeah, well, when that motherfucker gets shot with one. <laughs> yeah. Well, he appreciate. well, no, he did kind of show thanks for her taking the dart for him. He does. He's not. He's just very pragmatic. He's like, we got to go. Which is cold, though, especially in a moment like that, though. I mean, he's a cold guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the world's made him pretty cold. Multiple man's just a douchebag, right? He just... He sucks in this movie. He just comes off as such a douche. <laughs> and you put him next to Juggernaut, and he's the douchey one? Seriously? Like, Juggernaut kind of sucks in this movie, too. I like that Beast has to resign, because this was not part of their agreement. That, like, they're going to put it in a dart and put it in a gun. Yeah, he's like, I'm fucking done with it this. It was like... And earlier, they have a debate about, like, the cure and whatever. And Storm's kind of the hot-headed one, but Storm... Is beautiful Halle Berry. You know what I mean? And and Beast yeah. is like, some of us don't look like you. We're big, blue, hairy guys. Right. We get stared at. I like this because this is one of the few things that actually does also fall in line with the later movies. Like Beast's whole, like... Oh, yeah. Like the way he bit. feels about looking the way he does. The fact that he wants to... He's not against looking like a human. Or like curing himself. Right. Well, and we said this in the other episodes, too, but, like, it's obviously tougher on the mutants that can't blend in. Right. Or live a normal life like, like Toad. Toad. Yeah, fuck Toad, though. But, like, you know, <laughs> Beast and and uh, they mentioned this in the last one when Nightcrawler is talking to Mystique. Yeah. And they're, like, fellow blue people. But he's like, yeah, no, I get stared and I'm weird and, you know, I, I live in isolation. You can look like whoever you want, but she's very confident in herself. And she's like, no, I'm just naked me right right and it took her a while to get there yeah but yeah sure should have killed a bunch of people <laughs> <laughs> but yeah no i i get it like and actually agents of shield has a really good storyline oh, about the inhumans that is actually kind of a parallel to this whole thing like with the whole cure and how yeah. some of them can't blend in and how like the government's like actually afraid of them Okay. So it's a very like bunch of X Men. It's like X Men adjacent. What you mean to say is when they didn't have the rights to the X Men, yes. they just carried those themes over and placed them onto the Inhumans. Yes, because prior to that, the Inhumans were just like a royal family that lived on the moon. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Logan awakens Jean, who tries to seduce him on the operating table. They start making out, and she gets rough. Wolverine realizes her alter ego has taken over and demands to know what happened to Cyclops. This brings Jean back who begs Wolverine to kill her so she won't hurt anyone else. The Phoenix regains control and escapes. When I was a kid, I thought this scene was hot. <laughs> it's a little hot. <laughs> <laughs> she starts, like, clawing at him, and he's like, fuck. <laughs> he's like, whoa, this, this isn't you. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I think he's like, well, I can handle this, but at the same time, like... Some, something's something, wrong. Yeah, something's wrong with you. <laughs> and this is what we were saying. This makes clear that the Phoenix... Is the one that wants Wolverine. She's while, attracted the power. I think it's the animalisticness, like uh, the, just the raw instinct, you know. Meanwhile, Jean is you know, kill she, me. She loves <laughs> she loves Cyclops, and she murdered him. So she's like, "Fucking kill me!" And he's like, "I don't know what to do." <laughs> this is one of the parts where they kind of touch on the split personality. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, this is the most I guess they do with that. Yeah, and they just made it a sexy scene. Her eyes get all black, which is pretty cool. Yeah. That's a good visual. Kind of spooky looking. Yeah. <laughs> they go back to Jean's childhood home where they encounter Magneto, also looking for Jean. 
Professor X tries to convince Jean to let him help her again and to come back to the mansion, while Magneto intervenes, saying she has nothing to be ashamed of and should be allowed to be her true self. When Jean begins to shake the house, Wolverine and Storm fight Juggernaut and the Omegas. Jean lifts the whole house and everyone inside. She levitates Professor X out of his chair, and to the horror of Magneto, she disintegrates him. So would you say this was a nice parallel to the opening scene? Well, so again, there is something there, but they don't fully explore it. Because there is something to this where both these men are back to Jean's house, and obviously that was the intention, right? to try to talk to her again, and this time they have very different stances. Whereas before they were in agreement, now a lot of time has passed, a lot of shit's happened, <laughs> and Magneto's like, fuck this guy, he's trying to control you like everybody else. And Professor X is a lot more kind of manipulative this time around. Yeah. Where he's like, you need to come back with me. And at one point he's like, I can help you. I can stop you from killing anyone else. Like, killed Scott. He starts throwing that at her. Yeah. So. It's a little bit cruel on his part. I mean, yeah, but he's. But also, like, he's. He's to the point of desperation. Yes. That's the thing. And here's the other thing, too, is he made his decision. And again, all good stuff that's just not explored. He made his decision back whenever. And he basically created this monster. And so now he has to go all in on stopping her. He has otherwise, to, he has to try and clean up his mess. Yeah. Otherwise, it's on him. If she destroys the whole world, it's his fault. So he's past the point of ethics because he has to stop Gene. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of what he was saying at the end of his conversation with Wolverine. He's like, I made this decision. And here he says something to that effect. Like, and he's like, now here I am with you. Or, yeah. yeah. And, you know, he loses his patience with the Wolverine. He's like, I'm, I don't have to explain myself to you. Which is very out of character for him. Yeah, but it does kind of signify his desperation. Like, yep. that he probably does have some remorse with the ethical decision that he made. Mm-hmm. Because he's he's not practicing what he preaches. To. Right. And he is a good guy and he's recognizing that like, hey, you know, yeah. this, isn't, this wasn't the right thing to do. Exactly. Yeah. Good people can do bad things too. <laughs> <laughs> All the action in this is really weak. Like with everybody else. Yeah. Like, there's that part where Storm just kind of, like, she becomes, like, a tornado, like, a fist tornado. Yeah. <laughs> just the action throughout the whole movie. The, I'm the juggernaut, bitch. Oh, we're going to get there. Don't spoil Sorry. it. Sorry. Is that a spoiler? Yes. Okay. It was a so, big deal. Sorry. You sorry. weren't there. You were a kid. It was a big deal. All right. We'll we'll get to it. We'll <laughs> we'll cut what I just said. And <laughs> all right. All right. All right. Um, You're right. I was a kid. I wasn't there. You weren't there. Although I remember people in the theater getting really excited yeah, when we, said yeah, it. Yeah, we cheered. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, some of this action stuff here is weak. A lot of the action in this movie is weak, but... Yeah. The X-Men host a funeral for Charles. Bobby visits Kitty. To cheer her up, he freezes the large fountain so that they can ice skate together. Rogue sees us and leaves to seek the cure. Wolverine asks her to think it through and to be sure of what she's doing. Is this inappropriate? Is he kind of cheating? <laughs> Um, I'm referring to uh, Iceman Bobby. Oh, I thought you were talking about Wolverine. Out. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't think that was romantic. <laughs> no, 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 no. Hanging out with with Ro- Kitty. Oh, Kitty. Uh, I mean, maybe Can it's you- one of those things though where you got to look at it from all perspectives. Like, realistically, Bobby can't be with Rogue. But they're together though. They're together, but they're not together. No, but they are together. They're boyfriend and girlfriend. Right. So yeah, it's cheating. If Bobby was, like, having issues with the whole, like, you know, I can't, like, touch you or anything, he should have told her. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, like, and I understand, like, platonic friendships and yada yada. But, like, it's the middle of the night and you're doing this big gesture for her to feel better. You should right. have probably brought some other people. Either uh, brought some other people or, like, give Rogue a heads up. Or brought Rogue and maybe, like, you know, yeah. not hold hands not make it seem so because <laughs> is bobby even like in the kitty i don't it's hard to tell but the thing is this is a very again another very interesting thing that they did very little with yep because this, and the fact that they did so little with it it makes it super unclear and confusing yeah this is a very interesting love triangle yeah and it, well, it, it could should, have been a very it could have been and they should have explored it a lot more but i think the most interesting part is a part where kitty's like no, you don't understand because you have Rogue and I don't have anybody. And he's like, 
Uh, well, I mean, like, you know, we're friends. And so he takes her ice skating. And so he's basically saying, like, I can be your boyfriend. Like, that's, I mean, that's the subtext. You know right. what I mean? But, like, if you're looking at it directly, it's like, is he just being a nice guy? Like, to a well, fault? I, no, I mean, he can be as nice as a guy as he wants, but they're holding hands while ice skating in the middle of the night. True. And he created that ice rink for her. Yeah, has he ever done that for Rogue? Has he done anything for Rogue besides let her blow ice out of her mouth once yeah. when she absorbed his powers? But again, we don't see enough of Bobby and Rogue, and we don't see enough of Bobby and Kitty for yeah. any of this to actually right. mean anything It, it to should us. have been explored a lot more. Yeah. And this whole, like, you know, Rogue getting the cure, and Wolverine's like, you better not be doing it for a boy. And and that's it's interesting, too. very fatherly too. of him. No, and that is interesting, too, because, like, is Rogue doing it for herself, or is she doing it for Bobby? Uh, she might be doing it for herself in the sense that she doesn't feel like she could really have anybody. Yeah. But also, she might be doing it in the moment, because she she's might... like, well, I like Bobby, and yeah, right, Bobby right. wants to touch me. The thing is, is like, I mean, and she wants to be touched, and too. She, and yeah, yeah. She wants to touch people. She but has it, needs. She, <laughs> But, like, she might turn into, like, a mystique where she's like, fuck everybody else. I am who I am. True. You know? The issue with that is she can potentially very easily kill a lot of people. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Jean accuses Magneto of being the same as Professor X, wanting to control her. Pyro tries to show off his allegiance to Magneto, saying he would have killed Professor X if given the chance, which offends Magneto, saying that his single greatest regret is that Charles had to die for their cause. Yeah, Pyro's kind of an idiot. Oh, no, Pyro's the fucking worst, first of all. Well, yeah, he's been the worst since the last movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> since uh, the first movie, he was making a fireball in class like a dickhead. By a different actor. <laughs> by a different actor. <laughs> um, but this is a nice spot to reaffirm, especially since, like, Charles just died. Yeah. To reaffirm Magneto's friendship with him. Yeah, he loves him. Is that they're still best friends. They're yeah. actively friends. Despite everything that's happening, they've always been friends. Right. They had a disagreement at Gene's house, and he was still shocked to watch him die. And he was trying to stop Gene. He was upset Gene. to see that. Yeah. Yeah. Pyro has a very binary understanding of their conflict, mm-hmm. where it's like, good guys, bad guys, whatever. And he's very and, hot-headed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but Magneto is basically kind of reaffirming the nuance to their conflict. You know, yeah. it's very complicated. It's complicated. It's complicated. It's, it's com- Hey, hey, it's complicated. Hey. It's complicated. <laughs> Again, he's not evil, but he's determined. That's Magneto. Yeah. The team questions for like one second whether the school will stay open after the death of Professor X, and Storm takes up the responsibility of leading the school when Angel shows up seeking refuge. Yeah, they're like so dumb. So uh, is the school gonna? What are we gonna do about this? I'll do it. it Cause you know what? It's a fake <laughs> issue. Yeah, it's fake drama. It's like that lasts a second. <laughs> that lasts one second. It's like the movie. You know, at this point, it's it's like the writers are like, all right, well, we got to do something here. They're going to be stressed out about whether the school is going to stay open or not. Cool. But then they're also going to figure it out immediately. But at least we got another second of Angel in the movie. Yeah. And oh, <laughs> here's something I'm going to get into. I hate when movies think we're dumb and don't account for like travel time. Like when locations are involved. Mm. This entire movie is set in two places. Almost exactly. San Francisco and New York. And those are about as far of two places as you can get in the United States. Yes. Like opposite sides of the country. Yeah. They're yeah. three time zones away. They're each like a seven hour flight or something Not away from each other. if you take the X jet. Okay. Take the X jet. What's that? Five hours? Maybe four. <laughs> <laughs> it's still a very far <laughs> distance. And it becomes more of a plot problem later that they glaze over and it's fine because I don't care. But... Don't talk to me like I'm stupid. You know what I mean? Like, they're far away, and Angel was just in San Francisco. Now, sure, he could have hopped on a train. And How fast can he fly? There's no way. There's <laughs> no way he can fly faster than a jet, and then that would still take him seven What's hours. the distance from Tennessee to Miami? We're not, we're not doing this again. <laughs> I did the math last time, and I proved that it's further than you think is my point, and yeah. Angel cannot fly that distance is, is all I'm saying. So it doesn't matter. So he took a train. That's not the big deal. The big deal is later on when 100 people are in New York and then appear in San Francisco a second later. Maybe there's a mutant that can teleport. Ah, uh, fucking hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Iceman goes to the cure site to find Rogue, but runs into Pyro instead. They exchange words before Pyro attacks the site. 
Magneto issues a televised threat to end the cure. The president allows Trask to mobilize the military to defend against Magneto with plastic weapons armed with cure darts. <laughs> Here's another thing I hate. I hate when the bad guy takes over the airwaves. If this was a thing, it would happen in real life. I think it has happened a couple times in real life. When? It's never been like a bad guy taking over though. It was like always somebody like hijacking like a signal or like a station or something. Look you, it up. It's you happened. Can do, you can do that locally. It's usually local. It's never like You can't take national. over like every channel on cable. Like in the no. like in all the movies. It's such a trope that this movie is just like kind of like you've seen this before, right? So cool, we don't have to explain it. Magneto hijacked the airwaves. I don't hate this trope. Oh my god! Because it's an, I get why they do it. It's an easy way for like to have the bad guy be like, "Hey, I'm the bad guy, and I'm uh I'm threatening all of you." I will give you some of these. I will give you when Man of Steel in Man it? of Steel because it's a super advanced alien race. Yeah, and they show up on Earth and they're like. Yeah, we can hijack all this technology. Boom, we did it. And we can do it in every language simultaneously. I'll give you Boom, that. we did it. <laughs> there it is. But this, no, fuck. This is just silly at this point. <laughs> Unless maybe, if it, there's a mutant that can do maybe it. Maybe there's a mutant that can. That's how you solve all your plot problems. Uh, they're all oh, just one of the, this mutant, he and can I do it. And I bet his name is Airwave. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do like the scene with... Uh, Pyro and... Radiohead. Ace. That could be his name. Oh, Radiohead. That's a good one. <laughs> anyway. Um, Iceman and, and Pyro. I like the scene where they, they run into each other. I do, too. Because they've always kind of had, like, a... Even when yeah. they were, like, buddies. They, yeah. were, they were never, like, buddies. But even when they were on the same side, they had, like, conflict with yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, Fire and ice. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like they were destined to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's good stuff. That part. <laughs> that, that part specifically. Yeah, I like that part. Wolverine hears Jean in his head and learns where to find her. He single-handedly finds their camp in the woods and is attacked by a spike throwy guy. They stab each other for a bit while Magneto is given a rousing speech. He finds Jean, but Magneto stops him from talking to her and throws him out. With information from Mystique, the military finds the camp and attacks, but it's just multiple men pretending to be the hundred or so Brotherhood of members. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he does something, right? <laughs> Is the Spike throwy guy, is that supposed to be Spike? Oh, I meant to look him up. I didn't. Hold on. I don't think so. Because I think Spike's a good guy. And also, isn't he like, at least I'm going off of the X-Men Evolution cartoon. Isn't he like Storm's like nephew or something? Which is clearly, I don't I don't think that's who this is. Yeah, it is Spike. It is? Spike, played by Lance Gibson, a mutant who battles Wolverine in the forest. He's part of the Brotherhood. Bony Spikes. Okay. Check this out. Spike is the name of several fictional characters. Oh, of course. They are not to be confused with Spike, spelled with a Y. Oh, that's the good one. From X-Men Evolution. Yeah. <laughs> Nor with Spike Freeman, another character in groups X-Statics and X-Force. Jesus Christ. They use the name Spike a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In X-Men Evolution, Spike with a Y, he's the nephew of Storm. Oh. And he likes to skateboard, which makes him cool and a good guy. Anyway, yeah, that was stupid. All the action scenes in this just movie are stab just each dumb. other. <laughs> he just kind of stabs them, and then they run at each other. They stab each other because obviously he doesn't know that like a lot of Wolverine heal. action is just kind of him like flailing. Yeah, <laughs> it's just him kind of like slapping people and yelling. <laughs> it's again, I get how they were pressed for time because it doesn't seem like any of it was choreographed. At all. They just did it day of. Yeah, it's just kind of like, I don't know, man, run over there and just start kind of flailing Flail about. Flail your arms and scream. You've done it before. Just do what you did before. It was choreographed before. Yeah, whatever. And Hugh Jackson's like, all right, mate. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it. Arr. I do like the bit where, so he's giving his little speech. And he doesn't want Gina to think he's using her because he said it. he wasn't. But yet he goes... They have their weapons, and we have ours. And he turns his head, and he looks at Gene. So. <laughs> that was just poor directing, I think. <laughs> you don't know that you're using her? Like. <laughs> she will bring us to victory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Wolverine returns to the mansion to seek help, having learned that Magneto, Gene, and the Brotherhood plan to attack Alcatraz. The X-Men, now consisting of Wolverine, Storm, Colossus, Iceman, Kitty, and Beast, suit up and fly to San Francisco. There, Magneto and the Brotherhood seek a way to get to Alcatraz. 
They storm the Golden Gate Bridge, and Magneto lifts the entire thing to move the hundred or so of them to Alcatraz Island. And he passes by a family, and they lock their car door, and he just smiles at them. No, he locked the door, I thought. Did he lock it, or did they lock it? I thought he locked it. I thought that was the implication. I always thought that, like, they locked it because they were, like, Scared. Uh, <laughs> And he's like, yeah, that's not going to fucking do anything. Oh, uh, maybe. I, I guess it could go either way. I got the impression that he locked it because he's not that evil. He's like, <laughs> you guys are just civilians. You're not the people trying to cure me. Stay safe in your car while we fucking fight over While here. we move this bridge that you're on. And yeah. <laughs> I have a million problems here. This is ridiculous. This is so fucking stupid. First of all, and we didn't mention this, Worthington Labs is in Alcatraz? What? (laughs) Who allowed them to set up there? You want this to be like a good thing, and you put it in the sight of the most infamous, maybe the second most infamous prison of all time? Yeah, but it's not. You can go visit it right now. Well, it's a museum. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm saying, but what are you saying by putting the (laughs) lab there? I mean, that they just don't want people snooping around. Okay, well, they're like, oh, we, we wanted the most secure place. Alcatraz is not the most secure place ever. People it, have escaped it. It's it, Maybe it was like 100 years ago. Area 51 is more secure. Any building, you can make it more secure than Alcatraz. Yeah. Like, that's... It's just an island. Yeah. It, it, it's it's an the old, rock. It's an old prison. Yeah, you know what I mean? James Bond infiltrated it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but why... Okay, first of all, what I was just saying about travel, him and the Brotherhood of Mutants, his new gang, there's about 100 of them, right? Give or take. Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. They're all camping in the woods in New York, right? Mm-hmm. How did they get to San Francisco? Maybe there's a time skip that they just didn't tell us. <laughs> well, Wolverine goes back to the thing, and they're like, we got to go now. And they all get on the plane, and they fly to San Francisco. Yeah, but that's only like four hours for them. Exactly. How did he get 100 terrorists <laughs> to San Francisco? <laughs> he... I don't have an answer for this. But do you see what I'm saying? It's like... Yeah. And I get that it's, like, not important, and it's it's supposed to be you don't think about it, but, like... There's too much of that in this movie. Why did you set it in San Francisco, then? You should have set it in Boston again, like last time. And also... They flew to Boston, they came back to New York. That makes sense. Yeah. It's a half-hour, hour hour trip on a plane. Mm. Whatever. Also, where's Ant-Man? Yeah! (laughs) He wouldn't let this happen. (laughs) And then they get there and he's like, okay, there's like about a hundred of us and we need to get to Alcatraz. So here's what I'm going to do. We're going to walk on this bridge that is way bigger than it needs to be. And I'm going to break the whole thing off, causing hundreds of casualties. And just make a bridge to Alcatraz. And make a bridge to Alcatraz. But why does he need a bridge to Alcatraz? What he needed was a platform or a boat. Why not just take a boat? That's a lot less conspicuous. Sure. Unless he was trying to be theatrical. Their plan isn't to leave. I mean, eventually they they need to leave and then he can grab another platform. But all he did was create a bridge that allows the army to get on later and the X-Men to escape later. Yeah. So I see what they did here. They they, did it because it looked cool. No, they did for the plot. Well, yes, that too. (laughs) But they did it for the plot because they're like, well, we need the army to get there and we need the X-Men to escape. So we need a bridge to Alcatraz. So he moves the bridge. But he doesn't need the bridge. He only did it to serve the plot. So him doing it makes no sense. No, especially since he's supposed to be like an expert strategist. But also he's the only one that would be able to move a bridge. So, But the bridge doesn't need to be moved. No, it doesn't. (laughs) He could have made a big platform with metal and they could have floated over like he did last time. They could have just stolen a boat. They could have taken a boat. There's ferries. Um, Steal the ferry. You can fit 100 people on there. Kill a lot less civilians that way. Yeah, just Um, say... Get off this boat. I'm taking it. You don't have to scare the shit out of a family. If you wanted the gag, you could have a family on the boat. No. And they, like, jump and overboard. And you see dozens of people falling off the bridge and dying, They're too. dead. Like, a lot of people died. There was a lot of, like... I've noticed in older, like, mostly Marvel movies. Actually, they didn't give a shit. There was a lot of just, like, just random collateral casualties. Mm-hmm. Oh, they didn't give a shit at all. No. Granted, it is usually the bad guy doing it, so... Okay. It's not yeah. like um, Man of Steel where Superman's the one destroying the city. He's trying not to, Burrow. He's trying his best. He's getting tossed. Uh, was, was he trying his best? He's getting tossed around like a rag doll, and it's his first day on the job. <laughs> was he trying his best? Though? Anyway. <laughs> Magneto sends in the pawns, as he calls them, to attack the island first. That's kind of derogatory. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, <laughs> they get shot by cure darts and bombs that throw more darts in the air. Realizing that all their weapons are made out of plastic, Magneto sits back. The X-Men arrive in dramatic fashion and form a defensive line. 
Again, and it took him that long to get there. And they're on the X jet. Anyway. Juggernaut goes in to find to find and kill Jimmy. That's the little boy mutant who's poor who kid. Makes the, I know, right? <laughs> makes the cure. Kitty goes after him and he says his new catchphrase at the time. Don't you know who I am? I'm the juggernaut, bitch. Before breaking through every wall Kitty runs through. <laughs> All right, so I was young when this came out. I remember people cheering in the theater at this line. Why was this such a big deal? You've never seen this video? No. Oh, my God. Well, we're going to watch it right okay. after this. So at the time, there was a viral YouTube video. and this Was in... was YouTube around yet? Yes, but it was in its infancy. So bef- so when YouTube first started, I was in high school. It was, it was a great time. Oh, and there wasn't really copyright shit either because I used to watch episodes of anime on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it was all like people just like putting up their own content. Yeah. Like there you couldn't watch TV on YouTube. Big companies weren't on YouTube yet. No. None of that. So it's whatever people upload. Yeah. Bunch of great content came out that time, like Shoes. Shoes. Oh my god, shoes. I remember that. Hell yeah. There was also uh Leroy Jenkins. Yeah, I remember do remember Leroy that. Jenkins. Yep. Great bit. And then this guy. So it was a guy who he was dubbing over episodes of X Men with the juggernaut in them. <laughs> like uh, the nineties animated? Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's pretty funny. And basically, he's just like, fuck you, bitch. I'm the juggernaut, bitch. Professor X, fuck you. I'm the juggernaut, bitch. And he just kept on saying that. And that was like... That was his thing. That was his thing. And the movie appropriated the meme, basically. Uh, And this was probably one of the first movies to do something like that. Absolutely. And so when it happened, everybody in the theater cheered. (laughs) I can't believe I didn't know that. Also, I was like an actual child, though. So that might be why. Yeah. But... I was 13. Uh, you, you must have just missed it then. I, I probably just missed it. I remember this thing. It was. I'm going to link it below because I'm sure it's still on YouTube. And we're going to watch it after this, but it's a good Okay. Time. It sounds like the beginning of like uh, like the like a bridge series that they would do for like Yu-Gi-Oh! Abridged or like Dragon Ball Z Abridged. Oh, I don't know. That. They kind of just like do episodes of the show, but they dub over it. And but this was like, nonsense. He was dubbing. Oh, over. okay. Like those sort of follow a plot. It was like he muted. No, no, no. It's like he muted the show and just made up his own plot. <laughs> and it's all like, bitch actually was, sounds hilarious. It's like, bitch, where's my money? I'm the juggernaut. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't hurt me. I'm the juggernaut, bitch. That's the okay. whole thing. So this line is just a meme. Yes. Oh. It's just a meme. So it's kind of like when Black Panther was like, what are those? Oh, that was an old meme even by that point. Oh, but... yeah, yeah, yeah. There was another one that just happened. What was it? I remember talking about it. Um, in a movie? Yeah, shit. I can't remember. It just happened, though. Was it in Eternals? No, no, no. no. no Might have no been in Venom. In that Wait. One. There was a meme in Venom. Which one? Fuck. <laughs> I don't think we talked about it on our episode. Anyway. <laughs> but also, uh, Juggernaut's helmet looks dumb in this movie. It looks like a rock on his head. Also, by the way, Juggernaut <laughs> is Professor X's brother. Is it like his half brother or his something? His half yeah. brother, yeah. So he doesn't have that's not touched on at all in this movie. No, not at all. It's also kind of silly. I'm like, it's also not be... touched on in Deadpool. Like, should they be related? You know, it adds some depth to his uh, very boring yeah. character. The TV show does an episode on it, which is the bulk of what it was uses. like that episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, again, Magneto sending all the pawns in, and then being like. Like, he, again, he's supposed to be, like, an expert strategist. And the whole chess thing, that's supposed to be kind of, like, the metaphor. Right. But you don't you just know, throw away your pawns. No. They, they're supposed to serve a purpose if you're sacrificing them. And he's also surprised that they have, like, plastic guns. Like, really? You're surprised? They used this on you two movies ago. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> the Omegas try to kill Worthington, but he's saved by his son, Angel. Oh, look, Angel's back. Angel's back. Also, <laughs> how did he get there? He didn't fly with the X-Men. How did he get there so fast? Oh, it was probably part of his missing subplot. <laughs> God. <laughs> he was in, uh, and again, he was in San Francisco the whole movie. He showed up to New York to say one line yep. and then comes back to San Francisco. How is he like at so many pivotal moments, but he does like absolutely nothing in between? <laughs> but like, wh- why? Could you imagine the real life implications of that where you're like, <laughs> I'm going to get on, like, we live in Florida. I'm going to go to Washington State so I can... The jump. literal furthest I could possibly yeah. get. So I can burst into a room and be like, hey, I heard this was a place that uh, would be nice to me. And then I'll be like, All right, I'm going to go back over there where I'm from to be part of Because I think of this. my dad's in danger. Yeah. 
despite it taking me several hours to get there. <laughs> God, it just pisses me off. Anyway, Storm kills Callisto and Magneto. She, she fucking electrifies her. Uh, and oh, Magneto yeah. starts throwing cars lit on fire by Pyro. Pyro and Iceman fight. Uh, Wolverine and charges at Magneto to distract him while Beast sneaks at him with several cure darts. Magneto loses his powers in front of Jean. The army finally arrives and shoots at Jean, setting her off. As the Phoenix, she disintegrates an entire battalion and starts destroying everything around her. Everyone escapes through the bridge that's conveniently right there because Magneto brought it there. Wolverine charges at Jean knowing he will survive. She asks if he would die for them. He says he'd die for her. Jean momentarily returns and asks to be saved. Wolverine declares he loves her and stabs her to death, ending the destruction. How does Wolverine know he's going to survive if she can literally disintegrate people at like a molecular level? I know. I guess it's like, well, right now, he can heal faster than it. Well, he can't. Because His healing not... is actually kind of slow. Yes. <laughs> but earlier, we see how she disintegrates people in a matter of like a second. Yeah. So, no. I don't know. So that part didn't make sense. And also, again, the only thing Wolverine does is charge at people and, like, flail. In fairness, that was part of the distraction. Because Magneto's like, haven't you learned to not fight me, like, seriously? <laughs> and he's like, I have, because Beast is right behind you. <laughs> gotcha! <laughs> gotcha! <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> I Again, Magneto bringing the bridge only allows the X-Men to escape and allows the army to show up. Because he's created a bridge. So all he did was cause a bunch of casualties for literally no reason and allowed his enemies to flee. Yep. Which I guess ended up actually kind of saving his life. Because if he had left the... Like, if the bridge wasn't there, how was the military going to get there? Yeah, but how would he have left if the bridge wasn't there? Do another one of those little platform things. But he doesn't have powers anymore. How? I, well, he, he wasn't part of the plan. Uh, like, the military couldn't take boats. They're made out of metal. Couldn't take helicopters. Made out of metal. What about a plastic boat? Were you, what? <laughs> they don't have what, those. What are those little swan boats made out of? <laughs> probably wood, but still. <laughs> There's enough metal on there that they can... Yeah, he'll know. probably rip those pedals right out. And you're just <laughs> floating. They all have the entire army goes there in individual swan boats. That's you, what you, you want? You can take canoes. <laughs> Like, I get it for the sake of the movie, but it's dumb. Yep, pretty much. What else happens here? Uh, the I did like the um, Pyro Iceman fight. I think that's the only fight I liked. Yes. The and not even because bad. it was like a good fight. It was just, it was really cool to see Iceman like in his full Iceman form. I think it had form. the most payoff. Yeah. Because here's two characters that who's like fight. They've been setting it up for two movies. But all he does is they shoot blasts at each other. The ice is stronger than the fire. And then he like headbutts him. But I think Iceman <laughs> becomes stronger. And I think that's what it is. Because, well, yeah, because he goes into his full ice form and everything. Which I don't think he had done up to this point in the movie. No. If any of them. I think he does it one more time in Days of Future Past yeah, when he gets ripped in half. In the future, he learns to become. Does he get ripped in half or does he melt? He dies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. In the future. In one future. In a future. In this, pretty sure this is the first time he like goes full Iceman. It is. And it's one of the only parts of the whole movie that really have any like real payoff, I think. Yeah. Again, Wolverine's mostly just slapping people with his claws. And distracting Magneto. And then we meet so many stupid mutants. They all have jumpy powers. You see how they all just start jumping? Why do they all have jumpy powers? <laughs> They're all like <laughs> jumping at like the towers. And they're, like, hopping around a lot. How do they all have the same power? It's just like a generic, I guess they're all, yeah, they're all the pawns. They're generic mutants. <laughs> Wolverine gets in a fight with one that just kind of keeps on regrowing his limbs faster than Wolverine can slice them all off. Which is an interesting eh. mutant, I guess. So he kicks him in the balls and he's like, grow that back and runs away. He, he didn't <laughs> cut his balls off. <laughs> yeah, he's fine. <laughs> his stomach's going to hurt for a little bit, but <laughs> he'll be fine. And we mentioned this earlier, this Wolverine being the one to, like, having to stop Gene would have worked a lot better if Cyclops was still around. They could have done a three, a three-way a three thing. Ooh. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Yeah, they could get some polygamy stuff going on. I mean, like, in the fight. <laughs> oh, that's what you meant. Yeah. Like, at the final confrontation. I thought you meant, like, oh, they would share Gene because she's technically two people in this world now. 
No. <laughs> I mean, like in the final confrontation, I if think Cyclops was there, it if Cyclops worked was there, yes, it would have worked better. And I also feel like if he was there, he should have been the one to like take Wolverine's spot in this final scene, and then maybe actually kill him. Yeah, all that could work. Yeah, you get to write off your actor like you wanted to. You get a payoff, and then while Jean's distracted with Cyclops, that's when you can have Wolverine stab her. Yeah. Would've worked better. It just would have had a bigger impact than Wolverine going like, "I can heal really fast. I love you, Gene." <laughs> yeah, I did like that. He's like, "I love you," and then stab, 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 stab. I do like that. He really does seem like very upset by what he did. Uh, Hugh Jackman's a good actor, though. So, I mean, the movie telegraphs it too because what's your face? Storm even says like, "Are you gonna be ready to do what you need to do? Like, you're gonna have to kill her. We all know it." He does it. He only hesitates a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Two more tombstones are added for Gene and Scott next to Professor X. <laughs> the school unceremoniously, really. Like, all right, they're dead too. The school is open again. Beast has made a UN ambassador, and Wolverine looks out into the sky, I guess. <laughs> he's had a scene where he's just like looking out into the sky like He's probably thinking about his origin. Like awesome bad Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what's next for me. My solo movie. Where did I come from? <laughs> um <laughs> In a park, Magneto sits at a chess table playing with his metal pieces. He tries to move one and it wiggles. In a post credit scene, the mindless body Moira McTaggart was working with wakes up with Professor X's voice to her astonishment. All right, yeah, what the hell was... Was that ever, ever touched upon again, that post credit scene? I mean, he comes back to life. So that's how. How? He took that guy's body. It's just, it's so vague. And of course, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Apparently. Is that ethical? Yeah. Well, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> is Professor X still the bad guy? Yeah. So, okay. There could have been a little bit of payoff if he had finished what he started talking about earlier in the movie. Because in his ethics class, he was going to be like, here's an example. Here's my geneticist friend who. Friend. Yeah. They were on and off again lovers <laughs> who has his patient who basically has a brain, perfectly functional body, but like has no soul, basically. Like he has no consciousness. He's a vegetable. And he was about to talk about the ethics of like transferring a consciousness to this body. But then he gets interrupted and he never says it. Like we're left to just assume that that's what he was going to say. I think it's perfectly ethical to take over this body. <laughs> So, <laughs> is it though? I don't know, but like, it, you know, it just kind of, they had good ideas and literally stopped in their tracks. Like, they didn't explore that at all. And then it jumps to the end where he's like, I took the body <laughs> because I died, I guess. But also, how is Professor Xavier back in his regular body at the end of The Wolverine? Oh, because nonsense. That's and why. And during Days of Future Past. Because nonsense. Yeah, because nonsense. Because he looks exactly the same. Yep. And he it, can't walk again. It's How almost is like that this possible? movie just straight up gets ignored. I think that's, yeah. Like, this movie is not canon? I think when you look at the whole big picture, you have to say this movie's not canon, and then it makes the most sense. So Gene just died at the end of X-Men 2, and that's it. Well, because if you remember Days of Future Past... They fix everything, and they you see a, a future. I wish we saw this future. Where too. they're all fine. They're all yeah. alive. Cyclops is fine. Gene is fine. Beast is there. Bobby's there being yeah, all everybody's nice fine. with Rogue. So that's one timeline, mm -hmm. right? The other timeline is the Logan timeline. The Logan timeline could be that timeline just further down the line. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I think you're right. I think you're right. The other timeline was the Days of Future Past timeline. Right. But... I think the movies just make one new timeline after Days of Future Past, Yeah, right? but even then, it still doesn't make sense. No, because there's characters that shouldn't be the AGR, even if they're in a different timeline. Yeah, but even then, like, they, they redo the Phoenix Saga. Yeah, and so it happens when... way earlier. It happens in, like, what, the yeah. 90s? Yeah, right. So how does that add? You know, a lot of things don't add up. And I'm fuzzy on the details, but we're going to get there. I guess not a lot earlier. If it happens in the 90s, it's only 10 years earlier than before. Because this was, like, early 2000s. Yeah. Because I think... Dark Phoenix is in the 90s, right? And Apocalypse is in the 80s? 60s, 70s. Yeah. Okay. And for some reason, Wolverine's aging, but he's further back in time. Because <laughs> he looks much older to... in Days of Future well, Past than he does in... <laughs> in Days of Future Past. It's really confusing, honestly. It really... we. I mean, when we get to those new movies, I'm sure we can try and deconstruct the timeline. Yeah. 
specifically when we get to Days of Future Past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. First Class doesn't necessarily... No, 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 no. That's all prequel. It's like prequel to like everything. Yeah. And it, it might contradict like a couple things. But it contradicts way less than X-Men Origins Wolverine does. Which has Wolverine like saving Cyclops as a kid and shit. Okay, so in Days of Future Past, they create two timelines, right? One is the dystopian timeline. Okay. Right. Which is the one that Logan eventually goes into? No, no, no. no. The one where they all get killed by Sentinels. The one that we start off in. Yeah. That's the dystopian timeline. The alternate timeline, when they fix things, leads into Apocalypse, Dark Phoenix, and ends with Logan. Okay. Logan is the most distant future of the new timeline. Now, I haven't seen Dark Phoenix, so I don't know what happens there. Damn. So all of the timelines end in tragedy. (laughs) Yeah. But... (laughs) The new timeline with Dark Phoenix, we know that that's the thing. Like, we know she has to survive and then still be fine because we saw a snippet of the future in the end of Days of Future Past with the original cast. True. So I feel like they, contra- I, again, I haven't seen Dark Phoenix. I feel it like they probably contradicts contradicts everything again. Yeah, probably. So there's probably three or more timelines, really. <laughs> Even though there's meant to be two. Right. <laughs> there's on, there's honestly a million timelines for all the different continuity errors that there are in these movies. Maybe they're all uh, variants. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the best way to... The, um, the TBA is going to go nuts yeah. on the X-Men universe. <laughs> Here's the other thing. And I read this, that um, both these post credit scenes, or you know the Magneto ones, right yeah. prior to the credits. Oh yeah, we haven't talked about the Magneto one yet. Apparently none of those were planned. They were done like, just re- in case we make another movie. No, they were like done in reshoots. Oh. So like... They went out to London to find Ian McKellen, and they went out to a park and filmed it. It's like, here, just sit here and pretend to move it with your mind. Meanwhile, the Professor X one was filmed during, like, a lunch break. What the fuck? The thing is, like, even though the the post credit scene doesn't make any sense, it's interesting. It's just to say that Professor X isn't really dead, but then it's, what's the point of killing him? Yeah, Professor X isn't dead, and Magneto still has his powers. So what's the the point of anything? The franchise will continue. Yeah, but what, then what was the point of taking away his powers if it didn't work? And what's the point of killing off Professor X? Also, what are the implications? Is it that the cure doesn't actually work? Yeah, I guess. Maybe it doesn't work for the strongest mutants. Or like maybe Magneto. it's temporary and you have to get booster shots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Magneto, like, yeah, he, he can barely move that chest piece. Right, but his also, powers are still there. Also, why is he... Also, in Days of Future Past, he's Magneto again, full powered. Yeah, yeah, So they come back. Yeah. But, like, why is he just playing chess by himself? He's not playing with anybody. He's sad. Also, why is he the only one with metal pieces? He just takes his own pieces with him? I could see him doing that. He seems like that type of guy. Because those are plastic pieces in a public park. Maybe they have metal in them. No, no, his are metal. Oh. Yeah, I don't know if you noticed. They're, like, shiny. His are, he probably brought yeah. his own little pieces with them. And no one will play with him, which is extra sad. Aww. Also, he was a televised terrorist. How can he just be like out and about and nobody recognizes him? Because he's him? just an old man without powers. <laughs> Why isn't he in jail? <laughs> okay, well, that's the movie. He should at least be in jail. But yeah, that's the movie. <laughs> that's the movie. Here we go. Yikes. Um, so let's get into the analysis. Uh, I am, and, and again, you know, when we kind of do the plot, we talk a lot in there, but like overall, this is a movie that. Could have really been something. I was thinking this as I was watching it, and I was thinking it even more when we're talking about it. This is a movie that has a lot of bullet points of really good things, and then they just kind of like mention the bullet point, and that's it. That's yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Like they don't go into depth in yeah. anything that was like interesting. I think this might have been a very well written movie. I think there's a script out there that like maybe it's like a complete story. You know, with like everything in it, and it's not, it hasn't been phased by the production woes, you know? Yeah. But there's definitely a lot of production that like got in the way of this. It definitely seems like it. We talked about it earlier. We were basically saying, like, you know, they had a time frame. They didn't delay the movie. Didn't matter what happened, they were going to hit that time frame. And so, I guess they just wanted to capitalize on it while it was still hot. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's delay stu- it a little bit. It's just studio thinking. They don't care if the movie's good. The movie has to be made and has to make money. Right. That's all. That's all it is. And the creatives have to figure it out because deadlines. Here's the and, thing, though. If you push it back a little bit, delay it. Yeah, you're spending a little bit more money, but you might have a better movie that 
We'll, we'll not only get more. a good opening weekend, but might get good word of mouth that will keep people watching it throughout its theatrical run. Absolutely. And I'm... also, people will buy it when it comes out on, like, home video. Yeah. And I think this a lot, but, like, I think more movies need to be delayed. If it doesn't work out, delay it. Make the best movie you can make. And I know from, like, management perspective, you know, if you set a, a deadline, you need to meet the deadline. Like, things will only get made in the amount of time you allow them to get made. If right. you give someone two weeks to paint your house, they'll take all two weeks to paint your house. You think they're going to paint it on the first day and be like, I'm done? No. No. You know what I mean? So, like, I like I see both sides, but at the same time, it's like, hey, we're here we are, like, 15 plus years on <laughs> almost we're knocking on 20 in a few years on this movie yeah and we're sitting here going like this movie sucks it could like, have been better it could have been better like uh maybe a few more months of you know you delay the movie six months you compete with a different you know market or whatever you make more money you make a better movie and we'd be talking about a better movie today that could have changed the entire trajectory of the x-men franchise you might not have had to fix your timeline if your last movie in the trilogy wasn't so, like, poorly received. Yeah, who knows? I mean, there are some really good things that this movie starts off with. And that's what lets me believe that there was a good script. It just got you know? all chopped up. and Yeah. They didn't get to, like, we can't. We don't got time to film at all. We don't have time to get to these plot points. We have to write new plot points. To, we have like, to find a director. Yeah. <laughs> to kind of <laughs> connect the dots. You know what I mean? There's a part in this movie where they're like... Hey, this is all we got. It's just us. And it's three experienced X-Men and like three newbies. And I'm like, part of me likes that. I'm like, that's kind of cool. And that like, it's a ragtag team now. It's not the team that they had before. There's yeah. no Cyclops. There's no Gene. No Professor X. On the other side of that, I'm like, this is representative of this movie <laughs> where they couldn't bring the band back together. <laughs> they literally couldn't. And yeah, you're stuck. And this is this is what you got. This is the fucking team. Now what are we going to do? You know? Yeah. So, I don't know. I always also thought it was weird when they introduced, like, new major characters in, like, the third movie of a trilogy. So I'm just oh, like, I mean, oh. on that Beast. I love that guy. I, I love do. this character. I do. And Kelsey Grammer as Beast is flawless. I Kelsey think... Grammer is flawless. Yeah. I honestly think, I'm like, this is the best version of this character. I don't really like the one from the prequels. I don't I think, think he's, he's all right. I don't think he's beast. I look at this. I'm like, this is this is beast in a nutshell. Yeah, they nailed it, and and he looks exactly like he does in the comics, and he acts like him. Yeah, the suit that they put him in looks so good. Obviously, they goose him up, <laughs> but he looks like just a large man, like a like you put a bodybuilder in a suit. Like that like, was all practical, right? Apparently, yeah. Okay, but I'm saying you you put a like a bodybuilder in like a three piece tight suit. You know, and that's what you got. Yeah. That's what he looks like. Whereas I feel like the one in the prequels, he looks kind of like skinny in a way. Oh, I like think he, he is like skinny though. But he's no, no, I'm not talking about the actor. I'm talking about Beast. Oh, when he's in Beast form. Because I think it's just the actor blue. <laughs> yeah, but this isn't Kelsey Grammer. He's goosed up. <laughs> that's. <laughs> you, you see what I'm saying? True. Yeah. He, yeah, looks, yeah. he looks like Beast, who is a large Hulk. He's creature. a beast. Yeah. yeah. Whereas in the prequels, I don't feel like they nail it at all. Even though they have way more resources. I think they tried to just like... They did a similar thing with like Mystique where she's just never blue. Well, that's the other thing. Is that, yeah, they're like, (laughs) it's right away to not have to do makeup. But... Yeah. It's like, we can do it, but we're not gonna. Yeah. I think it's a great character. I wish we had spent more time with him. And yeah, to your point, I wish he was in an earlier movie. Yeah. And the other way around too, like, we were kind of mentioning, should Nightcrawler have been in this? Like... I would have loved that. Maybe? He was such a part of the last film. He had a surprising amount of character development in that movie, too. Yeah, it would have been nice if, you know, that could have carried over, too. And then you wouldn't have had such a ragtag fucking yeah, and team. him and Storm are like best friends now. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, they have Kitty running through walls. They could have had... Nightcrawler, Nightcrawler could have teleported, teleported them to Alcatraz. Yeah. Apparently it was a video game that explains why Nightcrawler is not in the movie. Is there really? It's well, called X Men 3, the official game of the movie. That's the title. Of yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that, 2006. Yeah, it, it takes place like between 2 and 3, and you play as Wolverine, Iceman, and Nightcrawler. Huh. I've always wanted to play it. Never did. Maybe I'll find it at GameStop. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> it's probably bad. It's a licensed movie game, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although, the King Kong game is very good. Really? Yeah. So, other things on this movie action's real meh. Kind of sucks. 
It seems like an afterthought. It's, it's borderline bad. Yeah, it really seems like an afterthought in a lot of these scenes where they're just kind of like, hey, we forgot to write an action scene. Some action has to happen here. Mm. You know, there's a little bit when they fight to get into Gene's house and then Wolverine goes on a random escapade and fights Spike. And they stab each other. They stab each other for a little bit. That's it. And then it's the end of the movie. That's kind yeah. of it. And then, I mean, the final battle... It's got some nice parts to it. Like, I, I appreciate that it is this big kind of battle between everybody. They tried to do, like, a big epic battle. It's just kind of people running at each other and punching. It's a lot of people who can jump really high. And <laughs> jump onto, like, towers and stuff. Everyone just kind of jumped up <laughs> at once. And I'm like, how many toads are there here now? Like, what is happening? There's a new score in this that's very generic. It was forgettable. Because I can't remember any of the music. And they should have... 100% kept the themes from the first movie. I, there were some scenes where I'm like, this would work really well if you had kept the music from the first movie. I don't know why they wouldn't have because done that. Because that, the theme for like the first and second movie, it's like kind of like iconic. Yeah. I want to say iconic. I No, absolutely. It's a great theme. And there's the part where like they put together the ragtag X-Men team and they get on the jet and it takes off and it's like, oh, cool. We're heading into the third act. That would have been the moment. You put that theme there as the jets flying Get everyone away. hyped. Oh, my God. It would have been so much better. Not in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> not good. Not rememberable in any way. Costumes were kind of more of the same. I liked when um, Iceman had like that leather jacket look, though. Did you notice Multiple Man had Wolverine's jacket? It's like the same jacket. There's a lot of cool leather in this movie. <laughs> No, but I'm talking about it's like it's like literally, literally the same jacket. Uh, it made me go like, notice. "Why are you wearing that?" So the prop department's like, "This is all we got." I th- I thought he just liked leather. <laughs> There's a lot of cool leather in this movie, just like all the other X Men movies. A lot of edgy as fuck. Yeah, the coolest looking character. I was. I'm just gonna say Iceman when he turns into Iceman. Like that actually looked cool. Yeah, I liked Hank's uh, Beast. Beast uh, looked good. Costume. Beast looked good because it almost seemed like more of a throwback to more orange and blue to your point yeah and i think that's what they were thinking because he's like oh he's an original x-men he already retired from being an x-men he's like the and original he, x-men right and he found his old costume because he's like oh this used to fit me blah 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 yeah and they make it like a little bit of a gag but i mean he, he's walking next to wolverine and you can see how the their suits look different yeah which is cool because it shows that you know there's some history in this world yeah they don't really touch on it. <laughs> no. But it's there. And we see um, a little bit of those suits in first class, sort of. Yeah, sure. And they, I mean, they don't exactly match. No. Hanks, it's but they're, sim- they're closer. Similar. Yeah, they're yeah. closer. But yeah, there's just too many things in this movie that you can tell started out as great ideas and then just go nowhere. Like all of Angel's plot. Angel subplot. The whole mute. Okay, so if you think about this, the last movie we said, one of my favorite things about that, about X2 the plot just seemed very natural because mm-hmm. they introduce a new concept, a new question, and then it's basically like, what's the natural progression that would happen in this situation? Okay. And then it just happens. And you don't question any of it because no. it's so well written. Was it the mutant registration? No, that was the first movie. No, that was the first. What was the second one? In the second one, you've got fucking what's his face. I mean, you have Stryker being you have a Stryker dick. Getting um, we watched this movie a while ago. <laughs> it's it's been a while. Yeah, that's the thing. Gonna attack the the X mansion. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he attacks the X he mansion. Got... He's like in the president's ear and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's being an asshole. Basically, he wants to wipe mutants out. Yeah, yeah. But basically, like you know, they introduce his character, and and then everything just kind of flows naturally. Mm-hmm. And this one, I feel like you introduced some really interesting concepts in the beginning, and you wanted the movie to then flow from that, which is like. We've introduced a cure. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? Which characters are going to want it? Is this something Magneto that should be cured? It? Are we a disease? Yeah. What's Magneto going to do about it? Well, he's going to, for him, this is a final straw. He's going to start his war. You know, you've got mm. um, the love triangle with Rogue. Meanwhile, we're also doing the Phoenix saga. So, like, you've got Professor X and his ethical debate that he's got going on. All these great things to kick off this movie, and then it all fizzles out because. They didn't execute on any of these no, things. They didn't follow up on any of it. A lot of it just starts out in the beginning. It's a kind of a good first act, honestly. And then it just kind of fizzles out after that. And then generic action scene, movie's over. Yeah. Right? 
And also, we killed Cyclops in one scene. <laughs> so, oh, X Men Two is a Cerebro plot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, it just came back to me. The so, Cerebro genocide. I think that's pretty much all I got for this. No, um, yeah, like I, I wish there was more to analyze in this movie. Yeah, it's really not. It's, it's pretty straightforward. It's shallow. Yeah. It is oh, what was it? I said shallow. on our break. It's a very dense movie with nothing in it. Yeah, we went on break and you said something really smart. You know, look and at now you. I'm forgetting it. Now everyone wants to party at my house. <laughs> uh, you said it's a very dense movie about nothing or something. <laughs> I think I said that. Yep. Because it is. So. It's like there's a lot going on, but at the same time, it's like it's nothing. Pretty much. It's so weird. It's it's a mess. Yep. There's a lot of really great ideas just thrown into a pile of poop. Yep. Yep. I'm I'm with you there. <laughs> All right, so this is Keeper Cancel. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is a segment where we decide if the people in the movie should be kept or should be canceled. It's a play on cancel culture. You get it. It's a joke. So I thought what we did was when we did the first X-Men, we did Brian Singer. Second X-Men, we did Patrick Stewart. Sirs, Patrick Stewart, and Ian McKellen. Yes. And now we're in the third one. I thought what we would do for this is just do a lightning round for all of the people left over. Because there's quite a few. There's a bunch. Yeah. Basically, all the people we're not going to touch up on later. Because there's a bunch. Like We're going we're gonna to get to Hugh Jackman. Don't you worry. Oh, we he's still got, have plenty of movies to get to him. He has like six more movies that he's in. So yeah. we'll get there. But... Let's start with Brett Ratner, the director of this movie. Just the grossest looking person I think I've ever seen. He looks like a slime ball. <laughs> he is so slimy looking. Directed the Rush Hour films. Which I, I like. Some of which are good. Two right? two of three. <laughs> also directed Family Man. The, sorry, The Family Man, Red Dragon, uh, this movie, Tower Heist. Uh, fun fact about Tower Heist, you know, written by Eddie Murphy. Do you, do you know the movie I'm talking about? No. It's like a comedy with Eddie Murphy and Ben Stiller. So basically, the idea from Eddie Murphy was that the movie was going to be titled Trump Heist. And it was about disgruntled employees of Donald Trump planning to rob Trump Tower, though references to Trump were later removed from the film. It was uh, called Tower Heist. Damn, that could have been kind of that funny. That could have been something. <laughs> Did they like get fired off of The Apprentice and they're like <laughs> getting rid I think this is one of those things where it's like we have to get clearance for all these things is going to be very difficult and it's like ah fuck it we're not even gonna try <laughs> trump sues everybody which so he would let's not even get involved yeah um well, actually yeah i'm sure they would have had to jump through a lot of hoops but they might have been able to get all that approved uh i don't i feel like no no so this is lightning around we're trying to go as fast as possible 84th academy awards that was the one in 2011 the academy blah 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 announced brett ratner would produce the awards However, Retner later resigned after remarking that, and I quote, (laughs) (laughs) Can we say that on Twitch? (laughs) He said, rehearsal is for fags. Uh, And so he apologized, but he didn't do the thing because obviously it's a shitty ass thing to say. October 2017, during the Me Too movement, a former talent agency accused Retner of rape. On November 2017, six women, including Olivia Munn, accused Ratner of sexual assault and harassment, as well as following an actress into a bathroom without invitation and masturbating as another (sighs) entered his trailer to deliver food. This is ridiculous. It's going downhill fast, man. (gasps) Uh, The same month, actor Elliot Page accused Ratner of sexual harassment and outing the then 18-year-old Page as gay on this movie, (sighs) on set. In front of many onlookers, including Anna Paquin, who later confirmed the story. I remember when this happened. Jesus uh, a Christ. former fashion model. Look, it just it gets bad. Oh, oh, wait, that fashion model was 17. That's real bad. Yeah, dude, this. Did, also, Brendan Fraser said, oh, uh, was misled into posing for pictures with the intent on selling them as part of Ratner's planned book. Uh, it doesn't go into detail. I don't know if he, he was. They were like. Sexy pictures. He, he like whatever. he took pictures of Brennan Fraser and used yeah. them without permission. Honestly, it's the least bad thing he's done according to all these other <laughs> yeah. things. So holy fucking shit, man! This terrible uh, person. Just, what a fucking sleaze! Like, I can just look at this guy. Huh. Anyway, cancel. Let's move on. Can't uh, absolutely uh, cancel him. <laughs> James Marston 
he was in the Saved by the Bell, the new class. He was like in an episode or two of that. You don't know oh. Saved by the Bell, do you? I know of it. Obviously. I never watched it. Right. But. Obviously, he left this to do Superman Returns, a uh, movie we're going to get to. <laughs> it was in Enchanted. He was like that He was prince. the prince. Yeah. yeah. Hop. <laughs> I remember a fan theory saying that. When Cyclops got disintegrated, he got transferred to the, the world of Hop. The Hop universe. <laughs> yeah. The Hopiverse. Sonic the Hedgehog, where it's kind of the same thing as Hop. There's a yeah. lot of he's, uh, he's parallels. He's pretty good in Sonic. I like him. I know I like Sonic, and I like yeah. him, and I'm excited for a sequel. Yeah, I did like that movie uh, a lot. He was in The Butler, okay. Dead to Me, and 30 Rock. He was in a few episodes of 30 Rock. He was like a boyfriend or something. Okay. Uh, James Marsden is... Uh, he's. I like him. He seems he's, like a cool guy. He's kind of like he kind of seems like a generic dude, but like especially in his roles. But like I like him. He's the donut lord in Sonic. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I <laughs> forgot about that. All right, cool. Keep Vamp Jensen, Goldeneye. You watch Lo- Goldeneye? I love Goldeneye. She's the one who kills people with her thighs. Yeah, it's hot. She's hot. Thick thighs. <laughs> And lives. <laughs> Literally. In this in this case. <laughs> yes. Also, in the Taken trilogy, she's like the mom. She's the mom that's always yelling at Liam Neeson. <laughs> <laughs> she's a nip tuck. Uh, how to get away with murder. All right. uh, here's a fun fact. She's a goodwill ambassador for the UN. That's interesting. That is interesting. So, keep. I always had a keep. little mini crush on her when I was a kid. She's Same. Very, very pretty. She's very pretty woman. Very good looking. Uh, Halle Berry. We'll do her later. She's in a movie. She's in a few other movies. She's in Catwoman. What other movie is she in? Days of Future Past. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> For but, a second. Yeah, but Catwoman. Who else are we talking she about? She is Catwoman. She's, it's, it's Catwoman, and who else is in that movie? Um, I don't remember the other The movie. guy from <laughs> Law and Order. The guy from Law and Order. The main guy from Law and Order? No, he's in one of the Law and Orders, isn't he? <sighs> he's like a detective. There's so many Law and Orders. Which one? The, oh, my God. SVU, Organized Crime, Criminal Intent. Benjamin Bratt. Benjamin Bratt. Oh. Is he the one that puts on the sunglasses and makes the puns? No, that's from CIS. Oh, wrong crime show. Law and Order is the good show. <laughs> anyway. In a criminal justice system. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so Halle Berry we're doing later. Kelsey Grammer. He's Frasier. Frasier Crane in Cheers and the spinoff Frasier. Uh, he's also Sideshow Bob in The Simpsons. I didn't know that. Which I didn't know, but now that I'm thinking about it, I'm like, that is him. Hmm. But it's, he puts on a slightly different voice. It's not the same Frasier. No. I love Sideshow Bob. He's great. Stinky Pete in Toy Story 2. Okay. Yeah, he's done a lot of voice acting also. Also has had a prolific theater career. Played Othello, Sunday in the Park with George, Sweeney Todd, The Color of Purple, Don Quixote. Don Quixote. That's all I got on him, so keep... Yeah, Kelsey Grammer's cool. I've always liked Kelsey Grammer. I like him a lot. I didn't watch Frasier, and everyone's like, oh, you should watch Frasier. Frasier's great. It's way better than Cheers. It's one of the spinoffs that's better than the original. Yeah, I've seen episodes of Cheers, but I've never seen a single thing from Frasier. When they walk in the bar, and everyone's like, hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, Rebecca Romaine, formerly known as Rebecca Romaine Stamos, because she was married to John Stamos. Uncle Jesse himself. Uh, she started as a model for obvious reasons. She's beautiful. Yes. <laughs> um, she was in Austin Powers where she played herself. And then a movie called Femme Fatale with Antonio Banderas Ooh. where she plays a femme fatale. <laughs> which is honestly kind of like right up her alley because... That's you know, what Mystique is. Obviously Mystique is a femme fatale, yeah. We're going to see her again because she's in The Punisher. The one with Thomas Jane. Okay, that's the one I've seen before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. she's in that. And, she's um, the girl. Uh, what's his face? He's crazy now from Greece. Yeah. John Travolta. John Travolta. <laughs> She's also voiced Lois Lane several times in a bunch of different DC things, like animated things. Like the shows? Yeah. Oh, and okay. And like movies, like the animated stuff. Okay. Like, a, uh, like the Bruce Tim stuff? No, no, no. Not the old stuff. The new oh, stuff. okay. Newer. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then Star Trek. She's in the newer, newer Star Trek shows. Okay. So, keep. Yeah, keep. There's keep. nothing wrong with her. She cool. was married to John Stamos. He's a little weird. Is he a little weird? He, he, he seems a little. A little he seems weird. a little weird. A little off. A little bit. Not like nuts, but like eh, a little bit. Like eh, he, I, he's done I some a, odd things. I have things. a strange mistrust for like handsome actors who have stayed just as handsome as they get older. Yeah, what are they doing? Like, what's Rob Lowe up to? He looks the same. What about Paul Rudd? 
Pa, no, but Paul Rudd is so lovable, though. But Rob Lowe and, and John Rob Lowe, Stamos. John Stamos. I feel um, like they're like... they're. Who else? They're, they're I, perform- I feel like there's one more. They're doing witchcraft or something, like Because they're like... <laughs> Did John Stamos make a deal with the still, devil? That's what I'm saying. Like They're still very handsome guys. Yeah, and it doesn't seem right. And they're like pushing 60. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's not right. It's strange. It's not right. It's strange. Sean Ashmore. Animorphs. I when I saw X Men for the first time, I was like, "That's the guy from Animorphs." Same. I was already into <laughs> Animorphs. I was really into Animorphs. I read all those books. <laughs> they should remake those. The fact that they haven't yet. I heard that they were gonna do like a movie or something. I don't know how how that's going. They should. They should. The remake. book series is fantastic. Yeah, they should remake them. They yeah. should. Voice Iceman in a couple things too. So he oh. kind of reprises himself. He was in superhero squad shows, like a little kids show. Okay. And also like the video game and a couple other things. He is a starring role in a video game actually where they actually use like his likeness and he's like does motion capture acting and everything. Oh cool. What what game? Quantum Break. Oh. oh okay. I think it's Sean Ashmore. I hope it's not his brother. He has a twin brother. <laughs> he has a twin br- I don't think it's his brother. I his, think it's Sean. They don't look that much alike. Like his twin brother's the guy in Lock and Key. Yeah. A couple other things. Sean Ashmore is definitely the one in the game then. Okay. I'm thinking about. Uh, a bunch of small movies uh, including Mother's Day, Frozen, not that Frozen. A different person, uh, Devil's <laughs> Devil's Gate. Uh, he's also in a few episodes of The Boys. Yeah, and he has fire powers in that. Oh, really? Yeah, I haven't seen The Boys. <laughs> That's so funny. Keep. I like Sean Ashmore. I, I do think too. he's cool. I've he, always he, liked him too. Yeah, from back from Animorphs, he needs bigger roles. I think he's pretty good. I think he's underrated. Yeah, sure. Uh, Vinnie Jones, soccer player first and foremost, played for Wimbledon, uh, Leeds United, Chelsea, and a couple other uh, clubs. Gained a notorious reputation as an aggressive player. Was he slide tackling everyone. Uh, I think he was like punching people and <laughs> grabbing people by the nuts oh, and shit. Well, that's like, a little bit more than aggressive. That's flat out unsportsmanlike. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he was suspended many times. He kind of was pushing this, uh, this like kind of like hard man. That's what they call it. A heel persona. And it's like kind of frowned upon in soccer nowadays, especially oh, yeah. in, in England. Because it's like, uh, it's not, it shouldn't be a violent game. No, and it's ain't hockey. Stop. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so after that, he got typecasted as kind of like, he really leaned into it as the like a thug and a criminal. Yeah. <laughs> From Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. Okay. You see that movie? No. He's a criminal. <laughs> uh, he's also a criminal in Snatch. Which is, is he also... a criminal in Gone in 60 Seconds also? Yeah, they're all criminals in Gone in 60 Seconds. <laughs> he could have been the good guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Euro Trip. As himself, basically, he plays a football hooligan. I yep, I saw that movie somewhat recently. So yeah, we watched it together, right? No, yeah. no, you watched it with Sable. Oh, I think we watched it. We talked I think, about I think it. Then you watched. We it. We watched a scene of it together. Oh, the Scotty doesn't know part. Yeah, <laughs> so too violent while playing soccer. So I think I'm gonna cancel him as a soccer player and maybe keep him as an actor. That's fair because. Yeah, he seems like a very unsportsmanlike uh, athlete, but there's also I, been like I've, other. It's been drugs and more violence, uh, and uh, maybe just cancel all around. Maybe just cancel him. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> I got last, not least. I just kind of did this in random order. Elliot Page, okay, formerly known as Ellen Page, uh, was in Trailer Park Boys, Juno. It's a good movie. That is a good movie. Whip it. That's a good movie too. Super. That's a great movie by James Gunn. Yes. <laughs> it's been on my list. I need to watch it. Inception was great in Another that. Another fantastic movie. I loved him in Inception. The Umbrella Academy. Did you watch The Umbrella Academy? I haven't seen it yet. I saw season one and I really liked it. There was a couple things that made me uncomfortable. Kind of adult. <laughs> it's kind oh. of like super rated R, that show. Okay. Yeah. It's based on a comic. I know that. Uh-huh. The Umbrella Academy. Yes. And uh, <laughs> written by, um, it's written by the guy from My Chemical Romance. The comic is? Yep, he wrote that. Oh shit, that's interesting. Well, one of the guys. I don't know. One of the guys. I think it might be. It might be the lead. The front man. Yeah, Umbrella Academy, season one. I didn't see season two, and I think there's a season three planned. Okay. Obviously, came out gay. I guess. Thanks to Brett Ratner. Brett Ratner, way to go, asshole. Way to go, you (laughs) dick. Uh, but just like a year ago or so, transitioned and is now a man. A man named Um, Elliot. Elliot. So. Nothing to talk about about like trans people. That'd be weird. Um, right. What is interesting, I think, this brings us this debate about who should portray whom, right? Because a lot of people, and I mean, 
Maybe this is a debate for another day. Uh, when we get talk about like representation and casting and whitewashing, because there's other movies that we're gonna kind of dip into these topics. Right. But there is, I feel like, a range of actors, and it depends on whether you're talking about race, whether you're talking about sexual orientation or gender, on what kinds of actors can play what kinds of roles. It is an interesting question to ask about this. Yeah, and I think it depends on which of those things you're looking at. Right. You know what I mean? And it depends on, oh, and also disabilities. So, like, yeah, you know, like, who can play certain kinds of disabled people? You know what I mean? And it makes me think of Tropic Thunder because they make fun of this. <laughs> the, the simple Jack? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Where he's like, you can't, well, he. They, I mean, it's in the movie. They make fun of it, but they're like, you can't go all the way. You know yeah. what I mean? Like all these people that won awards, they didn't go. Never all go the all the way. <laughs> That's not what they say. We're, we're but, censoring ourselves. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Yes. It, it, it is. I mean, that, that movie does a really good job of making fun of all, a lot of Hollywood things, including including whitewashing. Whitewashing. <laughs> yeah. So blackface to an extent. Well, mm. yeah, exactly. <laughs> so and method acting and all method this acting, shit. And, yeah. And, and I mean, is it okay? I mean, it's obviously not. <laughs> RDJ got nominated for an Academy Award <laughs> for did. all that. So. And but it's, I, it's a hilarious I movie. I saw a lot of topics here because, you know, in this show, Elliot Page, and I mean, he did it when, when he was still outwardly a female, right? Right. As Ellen Page and plays a straight girl. Right. right? And, and has like a boyfriend sort of in the first season. Mm-hmm. Ends up being the bad guy. It's a good show. But now like there's talk about like, well, do they need to rewrite that character so that character transitions? Eh, and not it's necessarily. Like, I, and I right and I and I get all of the debate about representation, but it's also kind of like this is an established story, yep. and, and it's a role that he's already playing. Yeah, and now what are you saying about Elliot Page's now range of an actor? Right, like, still an actor, still can do the roles he was doing before. So it's kind of like, what do you, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it's like, would he still want to do that role, or does he want to play males now? Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, so because I don't, I don't really have an answer because I, don't, I don't know. No, I mean, it's <laughs> very interesting to think about. Yeah, though, and it's it, um, it's something that I haven't seen before. Again, like it's just, I don't think it's a thing that's happened before. No, honestly. so uh, history because that show is still ongoing. So they're yeah. gonna they're gonna have to get to it at, in some. They're way. gonna have to address this in and, one way or another. And it seems to me. I mean, I don't know. I'm not there. I'm not the producers of that show. I do think they've retroactively changed his name in the credits, which is a nice thing to do. Oh, like on Netflix? I mean, it's on Netflix. It's yeah, they, they can do that. Like, they can do that. Yeah. They can't do that in like this movie. Sure. <laughs> but, but it's interesting. And I feel like in, in maybe how that's how they're treating the situation. They're very understanding and open-minded or whatever. But like, will they try to... I feel like well, they're just going to kind of put it in his hands and be like... Do what do you, you want what to do you repri- want to do? What do you want to do? Do you want to reprise this role? Do you want to keep a female? Do we want to write this into the show? What do we want to do? Like, do you want to wear a wig because you don't have long hair? Do you want to go back to like portraying female? Like, what? What do you? What do you, what do you, what do you want to do? Like, <laughs> you know? Is it going to be weird for you to yeah, do like, this, or are you cool with it? What yeah. kind of roles do you want? And again, like actors, and I still kind of believe like actors got to act. Yeah. Like there is, you know, as far as whitewashing goes and representation all that is very important but at the same time it's like you know if you've got a blind person you can't necessarily find a blind actor there's not really any of those maybe there are a couple maybe but you know what i'm saying and at some point like your actors gotta act yeah so donnie yen plays a pretty good blind person oh yeah and so does charlie cox charlie cox that's right Um, ben affleck not so much (laughs) (laughs) So, all interesting thing, I think. Yeah. But, great actor. Mm-hmm. And one of those where I look at uh, the filmography and I'm like, I like all his stuff. I like pretty much everything he's been in. I could watch Inception again, honestly. <laughs> and I should probably watch Super. So, keep. I like Super. Yeah, keep. Keep. Super is uh, dark, though. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've heard. So, I think that's, is that everybody I got here? For X3? I think for X-Men in general. Oh. Uh. There's a couple other people I want to do, oh, but I did didn't. Did we talk about Alan Cumming? Alan Cumming, I didn't. I deleted and I deleted Brian Cox. You got something on Alan Cumming? He's cool. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> he was in Spy Kids. Spy Kids. I knew you were going to say Spy Kids. He played Floop. <laughs> Floop. <laughs> cool. 
that's it. That's it for Keeper Cancel. Let's move on into the Phantom Zone. This movie, X Men. <laughs> The last stand. You know what? They should have been called X3. They called the last one X2. Exactly. This is stupid. It's confusing. But yeah, I'm going to have to put this one in the Phantom Zone. The bad far, far, far outweighs the good because the good is barely there. Okay. It's like sprinkled in there. I'm not a fan. No. No. I'm really on the fence. Really? Because this this movie has some good moments. It has some really good... You spent like two hours shitting on this movie. No, I said (laughs) it had a lot of good ideas that started out really well and then just kind of fizzled into nothing. This movie is too short. And the thing is, is like by the time you finish watching the movie, I'm kind of stuck with the things that I liked about it. And I'm starting to forget the things that I didn't like about it. And that happens sometimes when after you turn it off, you know, you're just kind of like, oh, yeah, that thing. Well, yeah. And I think that's how I feel about this film. Every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, yeah, it's not very good. (laughs) But then like later, I'm like. Yeah, but they had some really good ideas in there. That you know, they didn't do anything. I know, I know, I know. I'm, maybe I'm overly forgiving. But I think, final decision, I am putting it in the Phantom Zone because <laughs> it, it is a fumble. Like, it fumbles all these good ideas. Right. All these good ideas should be made into a different movie. I think this movie could have been salvaged had it been delayed, had they had written it a little bit better. And, and it might have been written great. Like I said, there might be a really I good script out there. I think it could have been the best of the trilogy. I think it could have done a really good job of tying up loose ends, mm-hmm. providing us good, ethical like, questions, full character arcs for some of these characters, like Cyclops. Oh yeah, <laughs> Wolver- at least Wolverine with Jean. Yeah, the ethical questions brought up by Professor X, where he's basically the villain of the movie. So, it's still Phantom Zone. But <laughs> again, there really could have been something here, and it's so sad that a trilogy has to fizzle out like this. Yeah. So you like Phantom Zone asterisk? Yeah, man, it's about to climb out. <laughs> it's it's clawing at the door. But it's like a general Zod. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it for us, you guys. Thank you guys for listening. Thank you for subscribing. Thanks to that piano dude for our musical intro. Make sure you leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or whatever else you can leave rating or reviews yeah, on. If there. you're on Spotify, it's not really a rating or review, but, you know, hit that little download button. I think that helps us. Yeah. <laughs> If you're subscribed, you'll just get our episodes. Yeah, just subscribe to our show on Spotify. There you go. Please tell a friend. And if you told a friend, thank you for telling that friend. Go make some more friends and then tell those friends. Um, You can find us on Instagram at Films from the Phantom Zone. And you can find us on Twitter if you want to have arguments. We're there. Films from PZ. And you can at us. Yeah, don't. I mean, shit. Do at us. (laughs) Yeah, do do an at. Yell at us. Yep. We're also on TikTok. Also at Films from PZ. Uh, You can listen to all our episodes on YouTube if that's how you like consuming podcasts. Hey, work from home, listen to us. Subscribe. Oh, yeah, like, like, subscribe. Bell icon, is that what you say? (laughs) Bell icon so you can get notifications when we release new videos. Yeah. (laughs) Also, guys, if you want to be a part of the show, you can do that. We stream all these episodes live when we record them. Our recording sessions, unpolished, they're unkept. They're uncensored. They're uncensored. Sometimes people barge in and play pranks on us. And we could say whatever the hell we want. <laughs> Jizz. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> what was I saying? Oh, yeah. So we stream these on most Monday nights on Twitch. So that's twitch.tv slash films from PZ. There's some chatting going on. There's some alcohols being drunk. It's a good time. So if you want to be a part of the show, hang out with us. That's how you do it. Other than that, I think that's pretty much it. What movie are we doing next time, Birdo? Is it Amazing Spider-Man? Yeah. Ooh. It's Amazing Spider-Man. It's Amazing Spider-Man. Or is it The Amazing Spider-Man? It's The Amazing... The Amazing Spider-Man. T-A-S-M. 2012. Right. And that is... <laughs> says here on DirecTV... The, what? <laughs> TNT, TBS, and True TV. if you're subbed to any of those things. True TV. I don't know how true These are weird places for that movie to be. Yeah, it's Sony. I don't (laughs) know how true TV any of that is. So you can rent it if you don't already own it. It's a pretty popular movie. But we are starting our Spider-Man watch because there's Spider-Man No Way Home. Yeah. Before you get too excited, we're not doing the Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movies just yet. Now it does much later. (laughs) So, yeah. So we're going to do Amazing Spider-Man 1 and 2 in preparation for... Spider-Man No Way Home. Yep. I'm excited about those. That's my favorite superhero. Spider-Man, really? Yeah. I don't know if that's not my favorite. But... My absolute favorite. 
since I was an infant. Wow. All right, cool. <laughs> well, we will see you guys then. Thank you and goodbye. Bye.